Hey guys, welcome to the channel, uh, and welcome to a brand new series, and the first episode of that brand new series. Uh, I don't have a name for this yet, so I'm open to ideas for names, but this is a new pre-recorded podcast series we're going to be bringing to you, hopefully relatively frequently. We can't commit to weekly yet because we don't have weekly guests, um, but we're going to be bringing uh, personalities, people in from the hobby community uh, and chatting to them and just having a bit of a chin wag. If you're watching this at the day it goes live, thank you so much, that means you remember. Um, we're going to put this out to members only first for five days and then it'll go out to everybody else. So if you're not a member, if you don't think the content's worth paying for, don't worry, you still get to watch it. And a big shout out to our fans who we've asked to put questions forward to our special guests. The idea and concept of this show is we're going to go out to various people in the community and ask them to come and sit and talk about their business, their channel, whatever it is they love about the hobby. I hopefully get some big names. I've got people like Peachy who've already agreed to come and a very, uh, a very fancy guest today who we'll introduce in just a moment. Um, uh, but yeah, this is this is what the whole series is supposed to be about. So please feel free in the comments below to let us know the sort of people you'd like to see on the show, the sort of questions you'd like to be asked. It's just going to be a chin whack. Normally I'd have Joe with me here, but Joe selfishly has to look after his child today because it's half term here in the UK. I don't know what I pay him for. Um, so I don't have Joe. So it's just going to be me and my guest today. And I, I'm very, very pleased. I promised he'd be the first to welcome the incredible James from C Studios. Thank you very much for having me. That's How you doing, mate? You. Yeah, right. great. Yeah, really good. This is, uh, I secretly chat, right? I say chat. It's not really chat anymore because it's not live. I'm, it's not, I'm not used to not doing live. But secretly, uh, I've already done this bit because I've buggered up the recording. Um, but this whole series is actually entirely your fault. Oh, well, I am very sorry I'm very about that. Very surprised now. Very, very shock very, face. Very sorry about that. Like, <laughs> um, I didn't realise that. No. I did tell him literally a minute ago when we did the first run-through, but um, we did a show with Dave from Mini Wargaming, yourself, and Steve uh, at, at Factorum. That was, a, that was a few years ago. 21, I think. I think it was 2021, yeah. 21, yeah, End I think 2021. So. Um, and then when we finished that show, I thought it was a really good show. I thought it was, it was a really nice podcast. And when we finished that show, you said to Steve, more people should do this kind of content. Mm -hmm. And I, that got me thinking, because it's like talk shows is probably my strongest point rather than actually playing the game. I'm pretty rubbish at that. Um, so yes. I thought I'd, this is a show I wanted to bring, but we, we didn't work bringing people to my home, sitting around the living room, being interrupted by the children. Um, so I thought instead, now we've got the studio space, this is something we bring. We were booked, we booked in a month ago. We had that terrible cold weather snap. It was literally like Alaska came and just yeah. lived in England for a little bit. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was not the, not the best. So we finally got James here. If you don't know who James is, um, especially in the 40K or the hobby world, you've probably been living under a small rock. Um, James <laughs> is owner, Seed Studios. Mm -hmm. Owner's probably, it's the right title? I think so, yeah. Like, I, I, I still do a lot of stuff on a day-to-day -day that, that I, I, I treat it like it hasn't changed for me, basically. So, yeah. Um, yeah it's, you know, How long has he been running for now? 11 years. 11? Well, coming up to 11 years, yeah. Coming up to 11 years. Officially 2013. Um, I actually didn't know yeah. it was that long. Yeah, so officially officially just literally at the beginning of 2013. So, yeah, so it's been, it, we, yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't feel it, but... Um, so we, we talk about Siege of Fairmount on the channel. If you watch any of the game streams, you will have seen us introduce them. Uh, say we're proudly sponsored by Siege. We run the little video. We talk about the Thousand Suns, which Siege painted for us. We've just taken a second delivery of uh, the second wave of Black Templars. But conscious that some people might come and find this interview, because the whole point in this series, if I'm honest with you team, is to try and bring more people to the channel and, and bring more subscribers in. Um, so some people might not have heard of you and might not have heard us talk about you. So did you just want to talk to people about what Siege is? No, definitely. I mean, I, uh, firstly, I, I, you're too kind and that's very, very humbling of you all the stuff you said. Like, I, I never ever expect or think anybody does know of us because obviously that the avenues into the industry do vary massively like yeah. and and there are names obviously that that are in on there they're straight away for people um so to to have people speak of siege in that way is is, is crazy in my mind but but um but yeah so so we're a premium commission miniature painting service we we basically paint uh, miniatures for all types of, of private clients we do a bit of commercial stuff um but we we our sole focus is painting super high quality miniatures at yeah. whatever level that we do for our clients you know we really want stuff that Looks great on the table and looks great on the, in a cabinet. If you, if you or if you're a collector and you want something on your, your shelf, your favourite character or whatever, blah blah. Well, then we cater for from beginning to end for all different things. Um, but yeah, eleven years. Um, you know, obviously just doing lots and lots of miniatures for lots of different different sort of game systems. I think one of the things we're stigmated with is is forty k, which you yeah. kind of touched upon. Um, we always get asked, oh, like, do you, do you paint like this this game system or this game system or this game system?" And the reality is, is that we'll paint any game system. Um, we just in a good way, I suppose, are stigmatized with with painting a lot of 40k, which is great. We love it. I'm not going to complain. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant set of miniatures to paint. But um, 
But uh, but yeah, we'll paint lots of different things. So. I think the problem is in our space at least, forty k is the giant out is, of all yeah. of like even even amongst games workshops, uh, various IPs themselves, forty k is the giant, right? So I think it's easy, and obviously the social media side, because I think a lot of what you paint is probably forty k. Mm -hmm. The yeah. social media side often shows off a lot of forty k. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think it's very easy to to kind of have this perception that that's pretty much all you do. Mm -hmm. um, but I've seen some incredible stuff that you've seen for. Star Wars Legion and Shadowpoint and other game systems as well. So you don't have to just use Siege if, if you don't play 40K. Like, you don't have to use Siege just if you play 40K. You can use them if you play any gaming system. I, th I think that's one of the things I really want to, like, for me, that is a real important thing just to get across to, to people watching because, like, we, that question comes up so much. Does it? On, yeah, it does, really does, because obviously we put out a lot of that content and yeah. obviously do a lot of, of projects for, for 40K, um, which we love. But if you were to send, send in some... Bolt action, or some Infinity, or some Malifaux, or, or any like that. We we would enjoy doing that just as much as we would do. Before so you're saying I can send you a full airborne, 101st airborne bolt action, aren't we? 100, percent yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll do it. 100, percent yeah. That would be brilliant. That make Jay sad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 11 years is a long time. Why did you start? Like, what was the whole reason for starting? Because well, I think we all start somewhere. So when I started YouTube, for example, mm. it was simply because uh, I started when I very first started YouTube. I was trying to make video game content. Yeah. Because um, I was just fancied learning YouTube and, and the nuances, and I was awful at it. And I stopped that, and then about three months later, four months later, maybe a little bit longer, I started with the hobby content. And I kind of started originally because I had a newborn baby. Mm. I was on the late shift, so Luke would go to bed early, and I would stay up with him until his 1 a.m. feed, feed him, put him to bed. I'd then go to bed, and she'd get up with him at 5. And so I started, I was like, I got bored. I didn't, there was no video games I wanted to play. There was nothing I wanted to watch. Um, I'm terrible at procrastinating away from painting. I literally borrowed a camera, put it on and started recording myself and, and put it on YouTube, literally as a hobby. Like there was no intent to, to make this a thing like, like it is now. Uh, eventually, obviously it grew and I'm now where I am now. But what I found was interesting was I didn't start it with the intent of it being a business or making any money. When it started to make money, it was a kind of, well, if it can cover the hobby, that's a benefit yeah. and it's growing from there. So why did, you, why did you start Siege? What was the kind of the, the, the fire that started that? I spent a lot of time in music, um, which okay. uh, yeah, so I was in bands and stuff, and, and I spent a lot of time in that. That all fell, fell through the floor, um, as everyone's as a lot of aspirations of music do. Um, and, and yeah, I came back home and just, just got picked out my Warhammer out of the loft again and then got on with it. And, and, and I, very similar to yourself. So it's, it's, just, it's always interesting that, that the starts that people have in industries and like how they, and, it, and it's really great to hear that, that most people do have a very innocent beginning yeah. where there isn't that kind of that that kind of um i'm gonna make this this thing and do that you know uh, that that's and mine was very similar to that like i literally started recording like just like kit bash diary videos putting them on youtube and stuff oh, okay like so i actually i actually ha had a channel that i was literally putting like kit bash videos how to strip models and all this kind of stuff like i was i'd started that um and i obviously put up put up stuff of painted miniatures and, and I just got a couple of guys approached me who were doing a, a commission painting in a, in a, in a very loose form. Um, and, uh, and yeah, like I, I literally just put up a few videos of some painted miniatures. They approached me, started doing it now, but I, I came back from bands and music and got heavily into, into sort of, uh, into my old uh, job, which was recruitment. So I've been in recruitment for a very long time prior to bands. I'd work in a job, Unfortunately, quit it to go on tour, come back, get another, you know, I, I do maternity cover contracts and stuff like that just because I just wanted to earn money, go on tour, yeah, yeah. play gigs, do all that kind of stuff. And then and then you come back and then build up a bit again or play some local shows or whatever, blah, blah. So for me, working in the recruitment industry, which is very regulated, it's like when you're dealing with people's careers, dealing with people's personal information, when you're dealing with like clients, whether they're blue chip, whether they're smaller companies, bigger companies, whatever, there's a set precedence of of the way that things should be done, if yeah. you follow me. And and when you layer over that, that the industry that I used to recruit in was like oil, gas, and mechanical, electrical engineering. So you've got a lot of regulation, a lot of trades involved with those industries. Um, so I, I started doing a couple of little commissions here and there for, for the, these guys that approached me. And, and, and it just wasn't professional, being honest. Like it just wasn't the way that I, my day in, day out, bread and butter kind of way of working. Um, and for me, I was like, right, well, that kind of prompted a light bulb of being like, right, well, how is this done in the industry or what is it like currently in the industry? And there wasn't at that time, 10, 10 and a half, 11 years ago, there wasn't that, uh, there wasn't anything that done it in the way that I personally wanted a client to experience having something done. Yeah. Um, 
And that's kind of like where it, where it started from. And I, I, I didn't get into it or didn't start doing it through thinking of like, I literally came back from playing music, got my Warhammer out because it was something to do. Yeah. And I thought, right, I've always been creative, whether it be painting as a kid or like the FX kits as a kid or whatever, blah, blah. So I thought, well, I'll just put it on YouTube as I've mentioned. And, 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 and that's kind of like what got me into thinking, oh, right, maybe I can do this in a way that potentially could lead to something. But the, 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 if you were to tell me back then that Siege would be <laughs> where it is now, I'd be like, oh, you're talking well, not nonsense. You know we've kind I mean? of had so, that conversation today ourselves anyway. So uh, some of what you've just said there really resonates, right? Yeah. So um, one, of the, one of the things I've tried to do over the last few years, at least with the channel, is I've tried to think, like, what kind of content would I want to watch, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So much like you, what kind of experience would I want to have with a commission painter? That's exactly Mine's right. been, what kind of content would I want to watch? Uh, when I've made content, is this something I would watch? Because if the answer is no, then I think I've made bad content. Yeah. If the answer is yes, I think I've made good content. And we've really tried to dial that in over the, over the course of the last six months uh, with the team about we can, we can kind of do this generic battle report stuff or we can kind of do this generic hobby content stuff, but would I watch that? Well, actually, the answer is probably no. Mm -hmm. um, what for me personally? Why do I watch YouTube? Uh, what what draws me to specific channels? And normally it's the personalities more than the actual content itself. Uh, and I typically find that I watch the same people over and over again simply because uh, there's something that appeals to me about that person. They're entertaining. They're funny. Whatever it might be. Yeah. So we've tried to push that in the last six months, and I find it really interesting that our concept now is let's make content we want to watch in the hope that other people also want to watch it. Mm -hmm. And yours was I want to I want to commission paint in a way in a, and, and provide a service that I'd expect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think some people, I think a lot of people could actually probably learn from that in itself. Like if you, if you like always ask yourself, would you pay for it? Would you, would you be happy with this? Would you be entertained by it? Would you watch it? Because if the answer to those is no, then it's probably not the best product in the world. A hundred percent. And and I think that, you know, I said like the, the, the really important thing for me back then was that like it was done in a way which, which I would be comfortable putting my name to and also having it referred on to other people and like yeah. the same thing for yourself like with the, 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 the battle reports and the way you've come across on the channel and the way that the team are etc you, you you almost want it to feel like you play games with them and you know them if that makes sense at yeah, that personal absolutely. level if you follow me and it does it does come across that way so so I think you're doing a phenomenal job with it so Siege, so 11 years, started from, I had no idea by the way, start from YouTube. Are they still on, are they still on YouTube? Unfortunately, I will take them oh. down this evening. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are, they are, but um, they're not the best videos that, you know, uh, as you've come to know from all the times we've known each other and all the times we've met, like editing and technology, I'm going to say this now, it was iPhone 5 and Movie Maker were my bread and butter. Um, Don't worry. There's still people right now that use phones. Yeah, uh, like, like li literally, <laughs> li literally. That was that was the way I was recording videos, like a dinky little tripod and a, a phone holder. But you know, it, it was for me. It was just a way of just, ex I suppose, expressing my hobby in a way which I could document it. I think that's more what I was thinking. Is like, I'll I'll do this, and if it helps somebody, then at least there's a there's a format or an avenue for someone to look at it and go, oh, you know, I think my claim to fame with that crappy channel is. I got 11k views on a how to convert a Chimera video from like front turret to rear turret, so it looks more like a Bradley a uh, armored fighting vehicle. Like for, for for me, that that was just oh, well, people are watching it, they like it, and it's helped them to then do that yeah. conversion. And I think that's kind of like documenting the journey of my hobby back then, but then at the same time, obviously giving a, giving back a little bit in the so way you, I can. Did you kind of have when you when you start put this content up? Did you kind of have any? Was it any, it was just, I'm just going to stick it out there. I'm just going to stick it out there, yeah. yeah. I literally, I literally just threw it together in Movie Maker and, 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 and then put it up and it's, it's horrendous. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's horrendous. My but... first ever video on the channel, <laughs> for 40k at least, is unlisted right now. I won't delete it because Luce has banned me from deleting it. So it's like your first model. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly, it's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it is. So whenever I, whenever I'm having a bad week, a really bad week, she'll be like, Put the video on. I'm like, I don't want to. Don't, don't make me watch it. She'll put the video on, and I watch it. And she'll be like, "Look where you are now. Look where you were then. Like, is it a bad week?" I'm like, "Okay, that, it's not that bad." Exa that's, <laughs> exactly. It's, it's that's a really really good comparison to like first model. Like, it is literally like that. Like, you know, I'm sure as, as painters or as hobbyists or whatever, you look at the stuff you first look at the stuff you're doing now, and you still critique and fault it or find issues with it because you want to paint the best you can or do the best thing that you can or produce the best video that you can. So that's really good. It's really good, actually. The yeah. first one. I, wa I wanted to. Do it. It's the reason why it's unlisted because I want people to be able to just like freely find it <laughs> because it's so bad. It's really, really bad. Um, but I, there's a couple of times on stream over the course of the last twelve months. So last year was a bit shit for us. Um, and there was a couple of times last year where I showed it on stream actually because I was like, "Hey, look, when I think it's bad, 
it, this is where we are now. This is where we were back then. Uh, I think it's really, I, I, as much as I want to get rid of it and I want to kind of erase that past, I think it actually is really important to keep hold of that and kind of it keeps you a bit grounded. I, I, that's exactly it. I think, yeah, having something there that does ground you is, is really important. In whatever you do, like whether it's painting, whether it's, you know, video production, whether it's uh, archery, whatever it is, like, you know, anything that you can always look back and, and, and reflect upon where yeah. you started, I think is very important. So, yeah. So you started as a one-man band on YouTube. Yes. You're now a premier or premium painting service. Yes. How many people on staff? Uh, office uh, office team is nearly 10 um, and then painting team. So we've got different brands. So you've got Warrior Workshop, which is our tabletop alternative. Uh, you've got the Siege Core teams, which is all the levels that we have. We've got our senior team and then we've got custom service. So there's various different teams within the thing. But in total, um, total complement including office is probably upwards of 90 now. So, so yeah. Jesus, yeah. God. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So, yeah, it's it's... Uh, it is crazy. Like it is crazy. That's that. that, that, that like it. it I how do you? I, how do you? Like I, I'm going to ask you slightly difficult questions today. It's fine. Right. How do you cope with essentially being responsible for ninety people's living? Because I have Joe. Yeah. That's it right now. Right. And I'm trying to get to a point where we can bring more people in, even on a part time basis. Mm -hmm. And I'm so incredibly nervous about. Hey, the channel looks like it can afford this part time wage for you right now. But then I'm, I, what I, we've had this conversation off camera a little bit. I, there's a little part of me, and it's a slither, but it exists, that is constantly expecting this bubble to burst yeah. and for everything to go wrong. Yeah. And I was so nervous about taking on this whole, this whole studio space because if it all shits itself and people stop supporting us, I then have this burden because I have the lease. And I, you know, so I look at bringing people in part time and I'm, I literally panic because some of them are friends of mine as well. But I literally panic that, well, if I can't afford you in six months, I'm then letting you down. Yeah. How do you cope with 90 people on the staff teams? It is, in the same respect, it is the greatest uh, privilege and the, the biggest, biggest, I must always work as hard as possible. Yeah. Like for me. Um, it, there isn't a day that goes by where I don't feel exactly the same. And I'm being honest with you, like, you know, I, I, for me, having the responsibility of that is the grounding thing. Okay. And it really helps with making decisions. It really helps with thinking about things as thoroughly as physically possible because at, at an early point, when you have one or two or three or four, whatever, that feels massive. Yeah. Exactly the thing you're saying then. It doesn't, it doesn't get any better being honest with you. <laughs> like, you know, well, because, thanks, mate. no, no, and I mean that it, any better in the sense of that down the line, it, it makes you more driven and it makes you more, I've got to make sure this is correct and right. Because yeah. think of it like, you know, if you were to chuck a pebble into the sea, it would make hardly any ripples. Yeah. But if you chuck a, a pebble into a pond, it makes a lot of ripples, you know? Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm saying that, that comparison is that like, you still have so many decisions to make and so many things that are affected by one thing that you decide to do. And you have to really understand that as the team gets bigger and as you do get a bigger company and as things grow, that the choices that you make, you have to, number one, maintain integrity, but at the same time, secondly, as well, like you really, really have to just think, is this the best thing, but not just for I, but for everybody that's that's involved. Yeah. You know, and I think that's one of the things, you, it is, as I said, it's a privilege to be in that position. And at the same time, it is so important that you make the right decisions and you don't do things which, and I, I'd never recommend overstretching yourself yeah. as well. Like, it's it's a, it's a very difficult thing and like i said it, there isn't a day that goes by in what i do and what the team you know and i say i but it's not it's not me like that siege has come on massively from, from when i started it like there are things it, the hardest thing and i think the hardest thing for me is that there are things that i don't do anymore that i used to do okay. every single day for example um just just like for example we have a it's crazy to think that like i've got georgian media now it's crazy to think that like you know, Joe handles all of the all of the the, the upside stuff now. It's crazy to think that I have someone packing the models. I used to like packing the models for me because that, that used to be a thing that I really loved, which sounds crazy as the owner of a business. I used to be like, I used to I love that, but I genuinely loved doing that because it was like I know that I've packed that hundred percent correctly, so that I've done everything that I physically can to make sure that it gets to the client perfectly. If that you, makes sense. You've been in the final step of QC, like, yeah, right, yeah, all the way all the way through, like yeah. from, from from looking at the models from that, that stuff. But the thing is, is as the company gets bigger and as as whatever you're building gets bigger, you become a Stretch Armstrong 
model or old man or whatever, blah, blah, and you get pulled all over the place. And the reality is, is that you have to take a step back and be like, I physically can't be the person yeah. doing this. I'm not the right person. I'm not the best person to be doing this anymore. I'm I'm terrible at that. It's the it's the scariest thing I, ever. In the in recent uh, in the last month, uh, we've brought Kyle on board, who's a local guy I've got to know, who, who's into the hobby, and he he just comes and volunteers. He's been producing the shows. And there's been two occasions where he's produced and two people have played, and I've not been involved in the actual stream for the game itself. Now, at the moment, I'm still in a place where I have to do the setup because they don't know how to do all the setup and get everything ready and, and prep the stream on YouTube and kind of build all that kind of nonsense. Um, and one, on one occasion. Uh, I had the kids, Luce was away. Um, this was before Christmas. This wasn't even Kyle. Um, that was awful because I had to take them home and put them to bed. I couldn't even be here when they finished. And then this last month, there's been two occasions where I've been on site. Uh, I've been here and I've been working in the hobby room and I can't, I pace the room. I hate not being involved. But I know I need to let go because yeah. what I noticed was last year, I had a week off last year for COVID, literally because I was sick. Like I couldn't stream. I was so unwell. I had a week off. And I was like, when, what else? What other time did I have off? None. <laughs> I worked 51 weeks last year. Yeah, it's so I, 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 the word holiday and me don't really have a good, a good friendship, <laughs> no. you know. Um, I, I do, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to admit that I work loads and, yeah. and to, to read my other half's annoyance and frustration, I don't switch off, which is the other thing, you know. But, the, but I think you kind of need that, especially when you're, especially when you're trying to do the thing that you enjoy as, as, as work, you know, and you're trying to build something, I think you kind of need to have that mindset and that approach to it, in, in my personal opinion. Um, but yeah, I took my first holiday, but proper holiday last year, in, I think it was September, um, and I, it was only a week, and it was like, this, for me, it was... Terrifying. It's terrifying, not, not because, and I just want to caveat this, like, not terrifying because, like, the team members in the office, like Joe, George, all the guys in the office, like, not... not not because they're not capable, not because they're not super, super engaged with obviously what they're supposed to be doing, all that kind of stuff. It's just the, the absolute fear of like, I'm not, potentially I'm not needed or potentially I'm not, I'm not <laughs> potentially, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, the thing that I started, I don't, I don't have involvement in. Like letting go is probably one of the things that is anything that you create from the beginning, like as it grows, letting go is one of the hardest things. Yeah, I, so you, yeah. One of the things I say is it's a really, this is a really tough thing to say to people because it makes me sound like an arsehole, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. My biggest problem with letting go is uh, with, so when, when we've got the team making, uh, putting out a stream to, uh, in an evening and I'm, not, and I'm not involved with that whole process, the big thing I struggle with, and I don't know if you've found the same, and this is nothing against the team, but I, my mind is always, they won't do it like I do it. They won't have the same, they won't have the same standard like they won't have that limit that I have. They 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 will allow something that I probably wouldn't be happy with. Or and I, I, don't, I'm, I actually, do you know what? I sit back afterwards and I think, no, they won't because they're all really proud of what they're doing as well, and they're having loads of fun and they're enjoying themselves and they really want to put on a good show. And the guys have been so keen over the last year pushing me to let go of a few shows and let them do it and let, let, let the kids play. But I always sit there and think they won't do it like I do it. I always have that struggle. I, I think. I understand that totally, and I think one of the, what I would say to that is that I have learned that just because the way I used to do it was the way I used to do it, <laughs> it may not be the best yeah, yeah. way to do it. And I think that's the scary thing. It's because it's because there, 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 people may people may say like, oh, someone else doing it. That if even if they do it eighty percent, I don't, I don't, I don't personally really like that. I think I think that like. Someone else doing it and giving that creative control and, and being willing to give that creative control in, in that task or that process or that thing, I think you get the best, best out of people for that because yeah. they, they feel like, right, well, they're trusting me to do the best that I physically can for it. Yeah. And I think you'll always get the best return on that rather than, it's not the way that I would do it. And yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying totally. I, I 100%, 100%. I've been exactly in that position multiple times as I've as I've gone right. Well, I'm not the best person to be doing that anymore, you know. And, and there was, there's also the other point of it where as you get busier and busier and busier, and you're producing more content, or you're doing more models, or you're doing whatever it is that you're doing, as the thing that you've created grows and grows and grows, because you're being stretched so much all over the place. In in sort of you're focusing on the future, you're focusing on the day to day, you're focusing on the the, the, the customer service, you're focusing on like like there reaches a point where your way of doing it doesn't plaster over everything. It's not scalable. Yeah. No, it's not scalable. And like, and you need you need that release and to give that weight of burden to somebody else so that they can do 
that to their hundred percent yeah. in the way that they do it. I know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hugely scary thing. It I really think, is. I think the biggest realization for me has been um, it has been being on the line of burnout for quite a lot. Yeah. You know, and and I found that it doesn't just impact the content necessarily for me. It, it impacts my hobby because my hobby is supposed to be the thing that I enjoy as well. And mm -hmm. I, I went for a long period of time last year where I didn't touch a model, building or paint, I didn't touch one. And it's, it's unlike me, despite the fact that people know I don't finish painting armies, I've always got the next project on the go. I'm always excited about the next project. Yeah. And that kind of died for a few months. And I kind of realized that because I was living and breathing this every single day and I wasn't letting go of any of it whatsoever, it was actually kind of killing it for me at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously a big negative. So um, I've started this year, I've come in with this year with a secret kind of resolution, not so secret now I'm saying it on camera, but a secret resolution that I need to let go a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And when they've run a show, do you know what? They've done fine. They've done a good show, been as good as anything else we do, if not sometimes better. You know, I've had comments of people going, oh, it's a bit chilled, Liam's not involved. I'm like, thanks very much, people. <laughs> so maybe I'll just get managed out of the own, my own channel. I, I, I honestly mean this, like, I think that one of the biggest things that, that anyone can do when they're in that position and they're growing something, like, and it reaches a point where you do need help, it is to get it, at, rather than trying to stretch yourself too thin over everything. Because then ultimately the tasks that you're doing, you're only doing them to 30, 40 percent. Yeah. You know, and 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 that's one of the things that I, has been extremely painful for me to learn over the over the years of Siege. At, you know, but I, I, the other thing that kind of helped me in that process is, is is really from when I was in recruitment, and I did see a lot of companies that had that kind of you know you'd walk into a company and you you'd meet a director or a manager or whoever blah blah, and you and you get this you get a quick understanding of how their business was run or how they would maybe not respect staff or maybe how they yeah. would treat staff and things like that. And I think that when you, when you give that creativity, there's still obviously conversations where you have to steer, where you have to say, well, actually, I don't, you know, I really appreciate that's a great idea. Giving the opportunity for that person to, to run with the idea, as long as it's financially viable, as long as it doesn't de re damage reputation or the integrity or anything like that. I think as long as you give that ability for that person to come to the table and go, I've got this idea, or I really think we should try it this way. Yeah. As long as it doesn't mitigate any of those factors that I said, what that's going to do for you is give that person a real fire in their belly to do the best that they can. Yeah. And then ultimately, is that going to give your business the best result? Most likely, yes, because there's that, there's that okay, yeah, they're happy for me to give it a go. Fine, I know that I've got to deliver. You know, whereas I'd see a lot of companies that would go, this is the way we've done it for 16 years. Um, I want you to do it this way. Yeah, but this could be really better. Or it could potentially do that. Could we try a little? No, this is the way. And, yeah. and the problem with that is, is what it causes is it causes resentment. You know, and, and I think that as the owner of a business, the owner of a business is always going to be 100% for the company and 100% for the thing that they created, yeah? Staff that work for a business, it would be an amazing opportunity to have someone that's 100% that works for a company. But the true fact is from the many years of recruitment that I've got, they're never 100%, you know? That and that's nothing course. negative against anyone that works for a business. All it is is that it's, it's, it's not that thing that they created. And because of that, se that separation, what you need to fill that gap with is making that person feel that their ideas, their thoughts, their, their things are valued. Yeah. You know, and they are valued. And truly, it's not just a case of acknowledging it and going, yeah, okay, blah, blah. But then when behind closed, door, closed doors going, no way, we're not doing it. It's a case of just sitting down and having a frank conversation and going, right, does it affect things negatively? Is it financially viable? Is it the best, way, best, best thing that we, we can do as a business? Just because I didn't, I didn't come up with it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. You know, have you have you ever had any failed experiments? One hundred percent. Like failure, failure is the greatest greatest teacher. Mm. Like um, you know, like we've again talk about like we've tried to run classes in like different locations in, in you know before, and and it, it, we run classes predominantly now at Element, obviously in, in Stockport, and run them in London at Bad Moon, and um, you know we've we've trialed some classes maybe in Scotland, we've trialed some classes at, you know uh, in, uh, at other locations before. You know, we've advertised them in the way that you do. Maybe they don't they don't fill up as as as, as much as other classes, etc. You know, it's a real funny thing with, with with that. Like you 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 kind of, I, I said this to you earlier off camera. Like, there's no reward without risk in anything that yeah, you do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and, and the complacency is the biggest killer of of lots of things, businesses, creativity, all those kind of things. And like and 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 really, like you need to have a little bit of risk, and you need to have calculated risk. I think yep. is but not just throwing caution to the wind and just jumping out the window or whatever, blah, blah. Like, you know, it's, it's like it needs to be, it needs to be uh, thought of thoroughly, but you do have to kind of have that air of risk to give you the ability to then go, we tried it, that really worked. Or we tried it, didn't work, won't do that again. 
Yeah. You know, and I, I, Siege is not a faultless business. There's all, I, I look at it day in, day out with the team. You know, the team will come to me with ideas and go, we've got this email format that we've been sending for X amount of years or whatever, blah, blah. Every year we review what we, what we the way we do things, the processes, all those kind of things. Because ultimately the goal is to make the experience as best as possible for a client and to deliver the best that we physically yeah. can. And, and I think you need to self-assess as well. That's, that's well, really the, and the thing is, that, you know, the industry is always changing in general. 100%. You know, despite the fact that the core of what Siege is is probably similar to what it was when you started, the, the industry is always changing. People's expectations change. You know, Adrian and I, Adrian from Titans and I always have this phrase, we have this phrase between the two of us, uh, um, everyone's a shark. So if you stop swimming, you die. Because that's what, like, if your shark doesn't swim, it dies. He's got no oxygen going through. Yeah. And that's what, like, if you stop swimming, if you, if you tread water as a business, typically, you probably fail. And that's that complacency I think you're talking about yeah, as well. Yeah, it, it 100% is. I think, yeah, like, do it, self-assessing and self-checking is just as important as, any, as, as, as thinking of new ideas and doing stuff. And I, I'd probably always advocate that you, you divert 50-50 attention to both of those things. Like, it shouldn't be 80% just on the newest thing, creating stuff, pushing forward, whatever. I think when you take your foot off the gas on checking where you are, reviewing and going, right, where are we at? Is this working the best it can do? Is this the best way to deliver something? Is this the best way to present something to someone? Is that the best recording method for something? Yeah. You know, I think, I think you, need, you kind of need that to then maintain consistency and, and ultimately quality as well in everything that you do. Quality of, of work environment for staff, quality of stuff you produce, quality, like all the, everything boils down to that. I never, ever take your eye off the ball when it comes to the day-to-day. -day. Like, I, no, yeah. I, I think that's... Yeah, there's, we definitely, um, our, our Tuesday, Thursday shows, every single show, there's something where I'm like, we could do that better. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't necessarily fix it for a few months, but it's, I'm aware of it. And it's an improvement I want to make at least. Yeah. Um, and we, I think over the course of the last few years, we, we've 100% made a load of change. Like I think people, if they really stop and looked at it, if, they, if you guys loaded up a stream from two years ago, loaded up one from now, despite the location change, take that out of the equation and look at the difference in it. I think... I think you have to keep looking at yourself and making sure you're doing the best you can. And sometimes it is okay to go, yeah, we are. We're actually doing the best we can at the moment. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so Siege, Siege is, has got three main wings to it, hasn't it? As far as I'm aware, anyway. You've got your Warrior war Workshop, mm -hmm. which is kind of this is. I forgive me for saying this. Say it, however you want to say it. Say it. It's it's your lowest quality. Correct. Yes. Without being low quality. I, that, I mean, that's a fair representation. Yeah. Like. Yeah. yeah it, do you know what it is? It's there's a few things. It's a st it's stylistically different. As okay. in, it visually is stylistically different. Um, it's more airbrushed. It's way more airbrushed. Yeah, yeah, it is way more airbrushed. It's designed more for for, for tabletop and gaming. It, you, look, you can still put it in the cabinet; it still looks great. It's, it's a different stylistic execution, as in like way more airbrushed with with lesser edge highlights, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, purely because that typically, like we use the airbrush for we do something called VCM or volumetric color modulation, which basically means we modulate the color to the volumes based on where the light's coming from, um, and. <laughs> you know how you talk about you and tech. Yeah. Now this is where I get right. Lost. Yeah. So so we had we had a chat off cam about, about equipment, and I literally like flew over my head because I'm not I'm I, I'm okay with tech, but I'm not like I don't know all settings and things with cameras or like what you said BIOS, and that means that that's a bit I don't I don't do cameras. So like, okay. <laughs> that's not even cameras. Yeah. That's a PC. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Perfect example. Yeah. Um. So so um. But. But yeah, like we basically paint in a way which is stylistically different from the other levels that we have at Siege. And that's purely to give a customer an opportunity of choice. So they have something that is, um, that is uh, more akin to something that you'd probably be good for tabletop and for gaming and stuff. Um, and then obviously just that, that is our entry point as a, as a customer. So it's more accessible, more accessible to a lot yeah, of people as yeah, well. It is. Then you've got your core business, yep. um, which is the kind of, I've, I always see this as the majority of your business at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. Uh, and there's various tiers there from, Bronze to platinum, platinum? Correct, yeah, I yeah. thought so. I have done research on this, um, and there's like so it goes. What is it? Bronze, silver, gold, platinum. platinum. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, obviously, varying costs. Yeah, and then you've got what was more recent. I don't know how recent this is now. The um, custom service. The custom service, which yeah. is one of the ones, if I'm honest with you, at the moment that interests me the most, because I think. Hear me out here for a minute. A lot of what you paint, yeah. um, even up to close to platinum standard, I think a lot of people, if they really put time, effort, and practice in, could probably get close to that standard. Mm -hmm. But when I look at some of the custom service stuff that you've made, I then am blown away to a whole new level. And I'm like, how, where did someone, how did someone's mind even see that before they started? Because a lot of it's, it's not just kit bashing though, right? A lot of it's actual sculpting as actual well. Actual sculpting, yeah, traditional hand sculpting. So, so we don't do any form of like uh, digital, 3D, like we don't 3D print, we don't do like digital sculpting, it's all done by hand. 
yeah, so it's all, all the CS team uh, all hand sculpted everything, basically. So, so, what, so if, if someone comes to you, this is some questions I wanted to ask you anyway. Fine, that's fine, but if someone yeah, comes yeah. to you for a custom service, how much detail do you need from the customer, yeah, or so is it is it very? It it can it, it can literally be. Uh, I love this bit of artwork. I want that as a model. Okay. Uh, or it could be. I'll give you a case example. So we had uh, a project recently, and you can go on our socials and see it. So we had probably one of the. One of the most crazy, crazy CS models I think we've done to date, which was uh, um, Auto Xenos Inquisitor okay. piloting a winged hive tyrant like uh, Ripley in Aliens piloting the cargo lifter or the, the lifter. Um, it, like you can go as in depth with the, with what you want to do with it as possible, and that's based on like the creation and also the the, the, the painting. So CS is the only thing where two two team members will work on it. Everything else, it's one team member that works on it. Um, be it a character or a large project, it'll be one team member that executes it. But with CS, you have a member of the CS team that will obviously convert, hand sculpt, and essentially render the physical form of that model on the idea or on the artwork or whatever, blah, blah. Um, and then it's handed to one of the painting team and painted to the relevant level that the client's having as well. So, so it's, a, it's a real marrying of two, of both of the sides of the skill set that, yeah. that the team have. Um, and again, yeah, you can go, you can go as crazy with the idea as as you like. Um, you know, uh, we've 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 had some really interesting ones over the years. It's been about two to three years, I think now. Yeah, it's quite years. quite newish, newish in, in terms yeah. of siege in general. Yeah, yeah. Right? There's some of the, some of the stuff I've seen has been uh, some of the stuff is like there was one you I think you put up recently, which was a, a Gabriel Seth conversion, where you're like, okay, I can see he's used the base from Ragnar. Like it's it's kind of obvious what's happened here on the whole, but yeah. it looks super cool. And there's some that I've seen. I'm like, I, I don't know where he started. <laughs> <laughs> How has he got there? Yeah, so it's really interesting because, like, I think host, like, when you talk about the model that, the model that sort of like is the the the, the frame for the work that's done, um, it totally depends on on the vision that the client has got with regards to pose, with regards to sort of like emotion, you know, the way that they want the model to convey movement, as I mentioned, things like that. So it, it varies. Something I for that one, like that Gabriel Seth one, which was Dave for Mini Wargaming, like, um, it. Uh, Ragnar made sense because it's in a charging, aggressive pose. Yeah. Um, which you wouldn't see Gabriel Seth just chilling at a bar, you know. He's no, like, well. He's like, he's, well, maybe. But, like, he, <laughs> but, but he, he, you know, that, that made perfect sense. But yeah, like that, it, that's always the really, I think that's one of the real telling things that when we, when we really hit the peak of what we try and do with CS, which is when you physically cannot tell what has been oh, used. Oh, some of it's to, unreal, yeah. James, to be honest with you. Yeah. Quest, awkward question time. Have you ever made a custom model? Because I, I assume the custom model is an incredible time sink, the hand sculpting. I'm, I'm assuming it's a lot of time. Now. Yeah. Do, have you ever got to a point where you've gone, hey, we've made this, and the customer's gone, nope? So one of the real important things that, that CS brings to the table for a client, and this is something that I'm really, again, is, is CS is like, it, Siege is my baby, but CS is like my, my, my child's child, if that makes okay. sense. You know? So like it's, it's like, um, for me, the process that we go through to make sure we get it right is, is we try and make it as scrupulous as possible, purely because you are quite right. The painting is a massive investment of time. You yeah. know, it is a huge investment of time. Sculpting, it's a, it's a huge investment of time, but the working time when you're sculpting is, is finite, if that makes sense. Yes. You know, as in like... Because it's drying. Correct, because it's setting or whatever the case may be, depending on the, the putties or mixes or whatever it is that we do. Um, so, uh, yeah, we go through a really regimented, scrupulous process with the client one-on-one -on -one just to make sure that, you know, at the point of them saying, yeah, that's it, you know, like, we know exactly, exactly everything that needs to be there, the way it needs to look, the way it needs to be, et cetera. Everything's done in that way. And it's purely so that that circumstance doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. Because, because the worst case would be is that we spend X amount of hours, which, again, once you spend time, you don't get it back, like, doing all this really intricate fine detail work or making the model look a certain way or whatever and then going actually do you know what that 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 isn't how the, the part i want the pose so yeah. we we don't encourage and i never encourage anyone to fill a specification sheet out within a day and then return it i always say make a cup of tea have a real good think take you your know, time take your time the time that you invest into writing a spec with us really really is just as important as the time that we spend working on the on the project for you it really does, like, it, it, we, you could go, oh, I don't just like the box. And we go, okay, cool, that's great, you know, like, or you could spend a week writing it and have, like, a 18-page a, a essay on, like, this is exactly how I want my project. <laughs> you know, I want, you know, the sergeants to have blue purity seals rather than red purity seals because they get a different purity seal because of 
their rank or whatever, blah, blah. You can be that granular with it. Yeah. Because it's that, that level of detail that really helps us do what we do best. So for, so for Joe, you're up on a job. I feel like I'm a nightmare. Um, because when we talk about the project, the yeah. thousand suns and the, yeah. and the Templars, yeah, Joe's like, here's a spec sheet. And I just basically write, I, I go tier for model, tier for base. And then he's like, okay, Liam, but colors? I'm like, dealer's choice. Don't care. Yeah. Uh, uh, do, you know, like, do, you, do you prefer people going, you have full creative control and I'm going to be happy with it? Or do you prefer people going, I want blue purity seals and sergeants? Do you know what? It, it, it varies. And I can't, give you, <laughs> I can't give you a direct answer on that purely because, because um, as much as it's great to get something that's like, paint it like the box. And we'll go, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, we can just, we, we love box art. So yeah, we'll just, we'll just do it like that or whatever. Um, creative freedom, I, I'll always say we, we love creative freedom, but with a caveat of some points of steering. So for example, um, I really want a, an Eandon army, um, you know, uh, just paint an Eandon army. You can go create as crazy as you like. That is all well and good. And we know it's going to be yellow. We know it's going to have blue, et cetera, blah, blah. Um, but what we would really appreciate as a minimum would be, I want an Eandon army. I like the colors red, purple, and maybe green. And then we know so that we can do some of the soul stones or spirit stones in purple and green and red. We can use maybe paint some of the blades in purple. We can, you know, giving us some key indicators of things that are that you do really like. Yeah, okay. Is 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 really helpful for us because then it means that we're not going, oh, we're gonna do an Yandan army, I'm gonna do the blades bright orange. And then the, the client goes, Oh, I don't like bright orange, you know, like so it, it really helps us knowing at least those few key things for us that allow us to do creative creativity but with a bit of confidence how often how often do you get a project request through so I, I saw a social media post from you guys quite recently mm -hmm. within the last few months of a request that came through i think the post even said wasn't sure about this one when it came through and someone had asked to paint an elder army mm -hmm. in adeptus custodies colors yeah right and i thought it looked the finished product looked absolutely incredible yeah how often do you get those projects through where you think I, well this is what he's asked for but I'm not sure. I, do, you, do you ever go back to the client and be like, are you really sure this is what you want? Are you really sure you want Custody Elder? The thing is, when, when a client's paying for a project, ultimately, they, they, they get to push the big red button. You know, okay. And, and, but and, do you kind of go, are you, like, do you double, triple check or? Well, we'll always, there's, always, there's always a duty of care to a client because the thing is, is you're quite right. Like, it, we can think of amazing things and we can think of these things which... which in our mind are great. Yeah. And then when they're rendered in physical form, it's like, oh, not so sure, you know? Yeah. And, and the thing is, is like, I think one of, the things, one of the things to really be, you know, again, it's duty of care. It's a duty of care to the, to the, to the client and a duty of care just to make sure that, you know, that decision is 100% grounded in. I know that's actually what it's going to look like and that's exactly how it's going to be. Um, you know, and, and look, we, we sit in a very privileged position to have a, a good knowledge of color theory, a good knowledge of obviously of miniatures, a good knowledge of obviously processes and, and painting techniques and things like that. So sometimes an idea on paper will look great or you'll see a bit of artwork or you'll see some something maybe that someone else has painted and go, oh, that looks great. But then when you have it done with your project the way that you want it, it might not turn out how you're thinking that it will turn out because of various different things. Yeah. Um, so we do as a duty of care, have a conversation you know, and say like, okay, you know, just want to check you want this, 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 this. I th I've said it before in, in previous times when I've spoken and stuff, like we had probably the craziest project that I think we've ever, ever done. Uh, in, 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 in Xenos, Inquisitors, piloting Hive Titans aside. Um, <laughs> like, uh, um, uh, we, we, we done a Space Marine Army themed after bacon, which is the craziest thing that you could, Ever imagine, and the videos are still on our channel on, on on YouTube, so you can go and search Bacon Space Marines if you want, or Space, Bacon Space Marines. Bacon okay, Space Marines is so, amazing. So, yeah, well, this is this is this is a prime example, and I've brought it up several times before. But literally, we had a client that had a Space Marine army, and the spec came through, and obviously, like, look, we we yeah, we have the initial phone, uh, initial conversation with uh, with with clients, and obviously via email or, or, or through obviously meetings and stuff, and. Um, and it, we just thought it was a normal Space Marine army. So we were like, oh, cool, okay, great. Like, we get to work on this really decent sized Space Marine army. It's, you know, really cool. Wonder, I wonder what, what chapter it's going to be. Um, the, the, the spec comes through and there's some building instructions for like loadouts and things, you know, that you'd expect. It got to the painting section and it was just like four images of pigs and brashes of bacon in the, in the painting section with, the tele with a, a line of text that literally says, I want a bacon themed Space Marine army. And, yes. okay. and, we, and we were like, 
this can't be serious. <laughs> like, you know, this can't be serious. So obviously, look, as a duty of care, I just went, look, you know, I just want to check. Obviously, that, that army is, is, the army's like, like a decent sized army. Like, are, are, you, are you sure this is exactly what you want? You, you haven't given us any colors, you know, you, yeah, obviously yeah. you've just given us pictures. And it was literally like, no, we want a, want a, want a bacon themed space marine army. I just want a fun army. And I was like, cool, okay, great. I, that duty of care check was there, but, you know, and then Ben, the team member who worked on it, you know, he just looked at bacon and went, right, well, it's pink and it's like a, a fleshy, vanilla, bony kind of color, like for the for the fat or whatever, blah, blah, right. I'm going to paint the armor the, the, the reddish color. The trims are going to be, are going to be um, uh, like the, the, the fat kind of color. Um, and then all the purity seals are going to be tomatoes and the purity seal parchment is going to be a rasher of bacon and with stripes on it and stuff like that. And it turned out in, insanely amazing based off of the most crazy spec. And to this day, like 11 years down the road, like, you know, it's still probably the craziest project. Is that, is that one of the moments where Ben, the person who painted it, comes to you and goes, is, is this real as well? Is it, did like... that, that happened at first. <laughs> um, and testament to Ben, because he'd done such an amazing job on the project that the client came back and done two more phases. Oh, wow. So, so, so uh, we, like, it was really, really clever, actually. Like, the Dreadnought had, like, the chapter symbol was a fist with a rasher of bacon, like, in the fist, which is quite cool. Um, and then we took a banner, um, like Sisters of Battle, one of the old paper banners, like, from Second Ed, and we just painted over it and done like changed some of the iconography on it and made it had the fist with the rasher of bacon and it said swine in the scroll at the bottom like that so it just yeah it was just you know what well, it was just a crazy project which again going back to when i started siege if you just said to me you're going to paint an army of space marines <laughs> i'd be like oh, are you absolutely sure like, have you been drinking you know, yeah it's just, that's not what i thought would happen but no yeah it was just a funny project but we've done all manner of things like all manner of like uh, crazy projects you know we've done a space marine captain themed after harry potter that was that was pretty uh, after slytherin like you know the guy just sent us a picture of snape and a, and a bit of green cloth obviously because slytherin's green yeah, yeah um so you know, matt who worked on that done like the um the oh, what's the symbol for the um uh, deadly hallows it's a deadly hallows symbol underneath as a chapter symbol which is quite quite interesting yeah like so yeah, just there's, there's just been some really interesting things like you know goth celestines. If you, like, if you get you know, if you get projects, so you, I, I would imagine there's kind of three. I'm I'm kind of spitballing here, but I imagine there's kind of three different sort of start, like types of projects. You've got your kind of bog standard, what everyone knows, and uh, ultramarines, whatever. You've got your kind of in between. It's space marines, but it's it's not chapters. a custom. It's, yeah, it's a custom chapter. And then you've got your crazy bacon space marines, right? <laughs> when you get those kind of those three different versions in, do you have? Like certain team members where you're like, this is a box art piece that goes to person A. This is a custom chapter piece that's probably person B. And this is a completely custom, that's, this is person C. Do you have that or is everyone part of everything? But that's a very good question. I, like, we, we tend to and try to be as absolutely fair to every team member as possible. And what I mean by that is like, I, even though years have passed, I'm, I don't paint anything for clients anymore and stuff, et cetera. But one of the things that's always been instilled with, you know, even with Joe when he first came into the business and stuff that he obviously saw with the way in the when I was allocating that kind of stuff. One of the things we do try and do is keep it as varied and as fresh for team members as possible because that benefits the team member because then they get a variety of work. But okay. also at the same time, it benefits, it benefits us as a company because that team member is pushing themselves on stuff that they wouldn't necessarily normally paint. So we, we do obviously, you know, we have different, different team members obviously in the business that have different attributes and skills and levels of, of their ability and stuff like that. So we obviously, there is an overlay of we need to match the right project to the right team member. But at the same time, we don't try and stagnate, stagnate a painter by doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Or if we know someone's really good at painting ultramarines, we're not going to always give them ultramarines because it's no. a safe bet. If that They'll get that sense. burnout. Yeah. yeah, there is that burnout, which is again, one of the biggest, you know, things that we try and combat for our, for our team, you know. Um, but but yeah, I would I would definitely say that um, that it is a like at the end of the day, you know, if you're foot into football, you wouldn't have Ronaldo in goal, you know. And I think that's the best way for me to explain it. Like we always try and marry the best person to the job, whilst obviously giving a duty of care. I always say duty of care because it, we genuinely want to make sure that, that team member is engaged with the project that they're working yeah. on. You know, um, I say it often like you know. Um, Every project you work on is, is never going to be your favorite, but, and there are going to be ones that you love and never want to give back. And I think that variety means that you can progress and also just enjoy the projects that you do work okay. on as well. So, yeah, so, fair yeah. enough. so we've got so we've got we've got custom, we've got kind of core, and we've got um, warrior workshop. 
Uh, and then recently, I say recently, this has been a few months now, you've just started a podcast as well, which is on YouTube. Yes, we have, yeah. And it's on all the podcast sites too, right? Yes, we have, yeah. So how, how did that come about? Why did you start that? That. The, oh, I, the, it's called? Pain Perspective. Thank you. Yeah. I did, I, it was on the tip of my tongue. That's I was okay. like, That's I'm going to be awkward now. I'm just going to ask him because I forgot the name. No, it's fine. Pain it's Perspective. Okay. Yeah, so Pain Perspective. So, so we, yeah, so we, we I mean, look, Paint Perspective and things like our Patreon and stuff like that, they are perfect examples of other team members having ideas and bringing them to the table and going, we should try this or we should do this. A lot of companies, again, saying this, team members will come to the table and bring ideas to the table and they'll go, no, we're not doing that. It's, yeah. not, it's not worth our time, whatever, blah, blah. Yeah, that's not us. That's not us. You know, And, and that's, the, that's the culture that I've tried to instill in Siege from day one is that there is that bridge of communication where someone can. So Paint Perspective, is our podcast, is, is very much that. Joe, previous to, to working at Siege, when he started nearly four and a half, nearly five years ago, which is crazy thinking about it, um, like he, he used to have his own podcast, but it was, it was really interesting. So he, he, he had a podcast that was playing Kill Team. There was no visual. It was all audio. So he had he had a podcast called Chill Team, which you can go and search. Uh, it is essentially playing Kill Team or audio, so you'd have to just listen for all the moves, the dice rolls, all those kind of things, all the all the things that would happen with no visuals at all whatsoever. Um, and he's also he listens to a lot of podcasts. He's really into podcasts. And then George, who came on from the painting team, so George was one of our, one that was on the painting team for quite some time. Um, we had an opportunity to rise in media and he's, he's really into media. So like he was like, uh, he applied for, the, for that internal role and obviously got, got the role. Uh, he obviously likes podcasts as well. So between Joe and, and, and George, they were both like, right, we should do this. It should be something that we should do as a business because it's another avenue for us to talk about miniature painting, which is ultimately the thing that we're about and we love. Um, and, um, and, and really sort of like use that as an avenue to, to, to give back as much as we can about just talking about painting and talking about different topics that maybe aren't being covered or just talking about painting in a way which harmonizes with what we're about as a business. Um, obviously we've taught classes all over the UK for, 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 for many years, I think it's eight years now. And like, and we often get lots and lots of questions about miniature painting on those classes in the, the Q and A sessions that we do at the end of each class. And, and it kind of like married up really well. Like, how can I do like a, a way to talk to people about miniature painting in a much wider format and cover topics within miniature painting? Like, you know, we've done one recently on brushes and brush care, which is something we get asked about all the time, you know. And, and it's just another way for us to, to engage with our demographic and, 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 and an external community, which we don't really touch upon unless you have a commission with us, if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So it, it really became a, a, that that avenue for us to have those kind of conversations and we, we, yeah, we, we cover all manner of topics to do with it's always painting orientated typically yeah. um what i found interesting so i've watched some of it mm -hmm. and what i found really interesting with it is is from my perspective at least it came across a bit more like a passion project mm -hmm. than a we should do a podcast right and listening to you three talking to each other it doesn't feel like some scripted we need to get this point across we need to teach this thing it just feels like three people sitting down talking about something they're yeah. passionate about so um, I find it interesting. You go, well, we felt like we should do this. It's a way to talk to the audience and give back because it doesn't. It just feels like you thought genuinely. And it, this is a compliment, by the way. This is one of the biggest compliments I think I can give. Is it just feels like three people went, let's just talk about a thing we love, yeah, and we'll record it, yeah. And I think that's amazing. It it is that <laughs> it is that. But for me, it's another way for us to give. Like the thing we often get, oh, we get, I said we get asked a lot of questions about miniature painting because of the privileged position that we're in as a as a company, and like. And I, I didn't have a method for us to do that. You know, I, I genuinely didn't have a method for that. Like, at, again, we, the reason we do online tuition is because we had people who saw that we'd done physical classes and go, I can't come to one, but I want to learn from you guys. So we started that. We have loads of people that ask us questions about, oh, I'm not too sure whether I should use a rattle can to prime or I should use a surface primer or this. And I, we can't physically in messages answer all those questions day of in, course. day out. Like, um, so, so for my kind of third of what I wanted to do with it. Obviously, Joe and George have got, obviously, the things that, that they thought about, obviously, using it for. Um, but, like, for me, personally, it's like, it's, I want to answer those questions in a way that maybe at that point that person hasn't got that question come to mind, but then they can always watch the episode and it's in there for them and they discover it during the process of listening to the episodes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's one of the key things for me with it. Like, you know, Paint Perspective is, is all about, you're quite right, George, Joe, and myself, we love miniature painting. Like, we immerse in it day in, day out because of obviously working in, in the company that we are, you know. But at the same time, it, when we sit down and chat, we, it is literally us just talking 
yeah, yeah. off the cuff about what about that that topic or that. It specific feels that thing, way. You know? It feels really genuine, and and you know, I think that, like I said, I think that's one of the biggest for a podcast, at least in my perspective, it's one of the biggest compliments you can give people because yeah, sometimes it can feel very wooden and kind of forced. And we must make this point. And so the podcasts I personally listen to are the ones where they don't feel like that. They feel like it's a literally chilled, a chilled conversation between friends. The exact, You've hit that. The exact way you describe the way you want your games to be portrayed yes, exactly. is the way that we want Paint Perspective to be. We want it to be this thing where, it's, again, and it is literally, we just set the cameras up, get rolling, start talking. You know, if like, a person, so if a person, from my perspective, at least if a person feels like they could be there playing or talking with you, that's exactly, I've, that's exactly what I've hit. And yeah. that's how I feel your, like your podcast come across. That's very kind of you, so thank you. So like, you touched on Patreon as well. Something I actually forgot you had, if I'm being completely honest. That's right. Um, and, but you also, you have a store, and I think mm -hmm. these kind of overlap a little bit. Because Patreon, you get access to loads of painting guides and stuff, mm -hmm. but you can also buy them individually via your store. A lot of people don't know this, yeah. so I wanted to cover it, because I've gone looking in the past, for certain tutorials, and I've, I've, there's PDFs on your website that you can download for mm -hmm. painting certain styles, models, etc. Yeah. Um, so, how, like you said, is there tons of content on Patreon or? So we've got over three. I have to, I'll have to fact check this, but I think it's over around about 320, 330 tutorials on, on Patreon. Yeah. So, uh, and what we wow. What, so it's quite a few, and we update that on a monthly basis. So there is, there's obviously, there's, there's multiple new tutorials go on a month, monthly basis. Um, and again, that that started like our Patreon. Like we we started doing physical classes, and we'd have obviously just to take photos of the classes, put them online, do stories, etc. Blah blah. Like when you know people would come on classes, and we used to get messages. Oh, like I'm I'm in I'm in the states, or I'm in France, or I'm in Belgium, or I'm, I'm here, or whatever. Blah blah. I can't come over. You know, and we have had some people come to England and come to a class, which has been super humbling and crazy to think about it. But like, but um, we start. That, that was an idea from one of the team members. He went, Hey, hey look, you know, we. I've, I've seen people commenting on Instagram, I've seen people you know, commenting on whatever, blah, blah. Like, um, we should do an online like tuition format. Like, it's not wafer to do it. So we started it and had no real expectations. And look, it, it does, it's got a decent, a decent amount of people on there, which is great. We've got a really good community, like lots of people that are very engaging and stuff. But yeah, you're quite right. Like, we would then still get questions of like, oh, I just want to learn how to paint ultramarines. So like, what I think we decided to do is just, it's kind of like, curate a set of PDFs which tackle a lot of specific things like maybe painting how to paint red or how to paint yellow or how to paint this kind of thing or this and curated a few that we just wanted to sell individually on the store yeah. um, and we gradually add to that we'll pull one off and we'll get we'll notice that, that we get a lot of people just message just asking us oh, specifically I really want to learn how to do this thing have you got something that I can just just for that so we'll pull one off now and again and we do progressively add extra ones to the store to, now and again yeah but the vast majority get put on put on our Patreon because it's 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 the best place to to go and learn. If you see what you, if you like what you see on our socials and stuff and things that we do, a lot of the, the processes and the ways that we do that are taught within the PDFs that we have on the store. CJ is such a huge beast, isn't it, James? It's massive. It feels no different from the day I started it in the flat above the chemist, except there's so much more going on that I physically cannot be involved with because of just the, the, the how busy it is and and like I, I think that's one thing that i'd say to anybody like that that you know that has a business or that wants to grow something and you know uh, you know never ever let something that you've created if it grows really big never ever ever forget where it, how it started and yeah. where it came from keep that first video that first minute yeah i think 100 mm -hmm. i really do think that that is something that being grounded and and you know being really immersed in the thing that you've created uh, all aspects even though you might not be managing a specific thing or doing a thing anymore like i think having the understanding of it to an extent so that you are uh, you are in a position of of confidence with things that go on in, in on the day to day is is really important um I, i'm still super hungry like there's still loads of stuff that i want to do there's loads of things that you know um i think the one thing i would say is that that thing you're scared of of like relinquishing like different parts or whatever, blah, 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 it gives you the freedom and the, most importantly, the time to then look at the other things where you want to go. So you, as much as it's, as it's hard, it's great because it means that you can then start yeah. paving the road in front, if that makes sense. Well, I mean, it, it's not going to work tonight, for example, but these podcasts are new, uh, obviously. And this is me going back into pre-recorded content because I used to do it. And one of the reasons why I stopped doing pre-recorded was my life was so, there's two, actually there's two main reasons. One, it's because I just flat prefer doing live. Mm -hmm. I prefer performing live. 
But the other reason, so that was the, the biggest reason, but the other reason was uh, pre-recorded comes with the added burden of editing time, yeah. which I, I was time was time poor. Um, so we're looking at um, one of the reasons for relinquishing control. I can be here on a, on, a, on a Tuesday or a Thursday evening, the team can be streaming and I can be sat out back on my computer and I can be editing. So I'm still here if something goes wrong. Um, and eventually it will get to a point where something will go wrong and they'll know what to do because yeah. I've been here when it's gone wrong and they go, oh, he did this and it fixed it. Um, but at the moment at least, I would I would want to be here in case something went wrong um, because the team is still learning some of the immense complications with a live stream setup like we have. Uh, but I can sit there and, and I can now edit because I'm letting them do the stream mm -hmm. and I could not pay attention to what they're doing. And that's quite liberating because otherwise I'd be like, well, where else in my week am I going to carve out this time? Yeah. Which is going to be three, four hours at least to edit this thing together into something that I'm, I'm happy to release onto YouTube anyway. Um, so that's, to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why I've started to hand over a little bit in places and it won't be con like, I like being involved in my content. So it won't be like I'm frequently handing over. It won't be every single week, um, that we're giving, uh, giving a stream over, but I like that it's giving me some time back to go in and try and chase other avenues and do other things. Yeah. I, th I think that's one of the things like, like, like those small steps at the beginning are really important because when you see that everything's fine and it's not Armageddon. You yeah, know, which is which is ultimately the fear. That is the thing. Yes. Isn't it? It's like it's like oh god, this this goes wrong or this happens. I think I think when when that that happens and you get that that confidence and not that you're doing it, so it's not that you haven't got the confidence. But when you when you're in that position, I think that that helps massively to then go right. Actually, well, I I don't need to do this. I don't need to do this because there's someone better than doing it than me. Um, that then gives you the freedom to go right. Well, there's this thing that I've always wanted to do that I would love to do as a brand or business or person or whatever. Blah blah. That I that I haven't been able to do, and now that I've got the time to do it, and you'll value that way more than the the fear of giving the thing over to that yeah. person, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, you'll see it. It would be amazing. It's it. You are right though. It is absolutely terrifying. It's it, uh, it's super scary. It, like it, the, the fear of giving something over is the is the is, is way more magnified than the fear of like for example when we had a conversation about you jumping and and, and going full time and doing all that kind of stuff. That fear of making the jump. Yeah is terrifying yes like terrifying yeah the fear of building this thing and then going i don't i'm, I'm going to give that thing that i used to do to this person that is even more scary yeah yeah it absolutely is and it's what, what i found really challenging as well is trying not to upset or insult those people that i'm handing over to because it's got nothing to do with their competence or their ability no. it hasn't and, 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 and you like I often feel like an absolute ass because I'm like I feel like I'm telling you that you're not good enough, which is not what I'm doing. I'm just frightened of letting go. That's a me problem. It's not a you issue. It's very much a me problem. <laughs> but it's not to do with how good you are. Uh, but yeah, I, like I really struggle to 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 kind of put that across in a in a in a way that they go, oh, he's not just calling me an incompetent arsehole. <laughs> it's difficult, right? It's hard. I, I think I think I think so. Again, going back to the thing I was saying about self reflecting, I think having that self-reflection and going, am I the best person to do this job? Even, yeah. even if the way I've been doing it, like, am I the best person for this? If the answer is, is, is honestly no, just that fish should yeah. go. Because the thing is, is like, you've got to kind of give that person the room to, to, to create that thing and grow themselves within that, that opportunity. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge, huge firm believer in, in, in giving people opportunity to progress and giving people opportunity to develop. Because again, I always nod back to recruitment. I've seen so many, so many businesses that just that just lock and key their process or their way of doing it, and it's they're actually damaging themselves in the future. Yeah, yeah. In the future because someone could come to the table and go, "I've got this idea. It could be the most game changing thing for you." And because of this is the way we do things, this is the way we are. You you stop yourself from, from yeah. benefiting from it. Like I hugely advocate it. Joe's got Joe's got for example Joe's got a bunch of ideas on on kind of narrative stuff we can do going forward in, in terms of content for the channel. And I what I'm trying to do now is go cool. He's got these ideas, but he doesn't know how to execute them. So I'm, it's like how do I how do I give him the tools? Yeah. Or how do I facilitate allowing him to execute those ideas? Because some of what he's well, some of what he's come up with for content ideas on the channel would be actual gold in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I think. And it's all him. It's not me coming up with this stuff. Um, and I'm like, but so then I'm trying to focus on, like I say, like giving him the tools and facilitating that thing and going, here's everything you need. Make it happen. Go yeah. for it. Let's, let's make it happen. Um, so I'm, I'm going to try and do some of that as well going forward. This space has unlocked a lot of that as well, yeah, right? I, I, because yeah. the, our previous space was, it was cozy. We took some videos and showed it to the Thanes of the behind the scenes in the garage once I'd moved out. And people were like, 
there is no way that's the same space. I was like, yes, it was. This is all we had. <laughs> I, I said this to you when, we, when I came in here, but like, honestly, this setup and this space is is amazing. Thanks, like, and you, from 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 that that space you're talking about to this, it's incredible. Honestly, yeah. it's it's like it's an amazing, amazing jump in sort of like where you've where you started to where you are now you know so you 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 solidly grafted and it's, it's paid off so, so we, i still i still come in here uh tuesdays and thursdays at the very least sometimes i'm in here mondays and fridays as well i still come in here and there's a little bit of a pinch that has to happen like this is my space that's never, my logo on the wall never forget that because yeah. that, that's what will drive so do you, do you still do that with siege 100 i like the, the building that we're in i started so i i was in two foot done i ran siege from my first flat my second flat and then i got the building one one room in the building that we're in now um even now when we have multiple floors on the build in the building um like going into the room that i started the business in where everything was in one at one room i still think to myself this is insane like this is crazy like that we've gone from where where it started to having uh, I, uh, having a floor in a building when i got the, the first i had both all the rooms on the first floor, i was like this is this is this is nuts like <laughs> this is like this is crazy and then yeah. like and then and then we took the second floor, but so yeah. So even go, I said going into the first room that I started the company, like when I when I had the office, like going into that first room. It, there's still multiple times when when like I'll be recording like a showcase video or whatever, and George, I'll be George will be setting something up or doing something before starting. I'll just be sitting there waiting to go, thinking, I, I, like my desk used to be there, the media table used to be there, like I used to pack models over there, like you know, yeah. like it's 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 it's. it's yeah, it, you do have to those little nods and reflect, reflections back to the way it started in the past. They are never cherish those because they, they they are very I important. Was, uh, my garage is now an actual garage, and I keep my bike in there. And I was in there um, last Wednesday afternoon, um, sat cleaning the bike, and I sat back on the stool and just sort of looked around. So the wall is still the same wall that we had when we made that for the stream, but the big backdrop is gone now because I didn't need any more, and I didn't want to get the bike in. And I sort of sat there for a moment, and I was like. Uh, and Luce came, Luce, uh, funny, actually, Luce came in and then she was like, you're right. I was like, how do we do it? How do we actually do it in here for like two years? She went, and she looked around and she was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> and that was, it was a really like down to earth, humbling moment to sit there and be like, we made this work. And I think, I, I don't know if you have a similar experience in your kind of industry or your area of the industry, but I certainly get a lot of people that ask for a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and a lot, one of the biggest things I tell people, or one of my biggest kind of pieces of advice to people is, just go for it. Mm -hmm. Because if you always find a thing that stops you from going for it or, or an excuse not to make your first video, post your first piece of content or whatever. Uh, I was talking to, we, I had Daryl here from uh, Lazy Car Architect earlier. And the, the phrase I like to give to people is, perfect is the enemy of finished, mm -hmm. always. So if you, if you want your first video to be perfect, you'll probably never post it. Mm -hmm. It just won't happen. Um, if you really want to do it, if you really want to go for it, you'll make what you have work mm -hmm. somehow. Yeah, um, and that's what we did. Like that garage was, I I can't believe we streamed out there for two years with, with three grown sweaty men in a tiny <laughs> little box. It was, it was awful at times. Yeah, well, some, I'd say some of the heat waves that we. Had. <laughs> yeah. Um, I tell you what. So so when I the circumstances of me going full time with Siege, and, and I have said this in other places, but I'll say it again. Like so, I I I was at a point in recruitment. I was doing very well, and I enjoyed my recruitment. I love recruitment. Like it was, it, I really enjoyed doing it. And and um and uh. I, I had my, I had an end of year bonus coming up. Um, my mortgage was depending on it at the time. And um, I had the carpet pulled from under my feet, goalpost changed for my commission structure, which meant I essentially lost a, a hefty chunk of the end of year bonus from commission that I was supposed to be getting, which literally sunk, sunk my, sunk my, my mortgage. And I, I literally quit on the spot. Um, I, had, I didn't take much holiday, me being the way I am. I literally just, I didn't have many reasons to take holiday. And I, I you know, I'd sacrificed relationships, sacrificed everything for work and all that, blah, blah. Um, and, and I literally just walked into my director's office and said, look, you know, this has happened. You know what's happened, obviously. We've had conversations about it. I'm, I'm, I'm giving my notice. Yeah, I'm done. Um, the next day, I woke up and all the times I'd said to myself, oh, you know, one day, one day I'll, I'll do this. One day, one day I'll, 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 I'll do, I'll, maybe I'll start doing this. I thought, this is day one. Yeah, and I never looked back. I, I found out through the grapevine of people I worked with at the office uh, in recruitment that my, my director had gone in and said to the whole entire company in the mo Monday morning meeting, like, um, James has left to go and paint toy soldiers for a living and make a bit of a joke of it, blah, blah. I saw him about five years later at the station near, near the office. Um, and he stopped me and he was like, 
I, I'm actually blown away with what you've done. I've seen because I've still got him on LinkedIn, and obviously I post a lot of wargaming stuff on LinkedIn. And um, and he said, I, I, I'm really sorry for for making a bit of a joke of you going and painting the toy soldiers. And it was the best gratification ever because it made me think, well, look, if if that when that, when I found out that was said, it put the biggest fire in my belly to just go. One day I'm going to make you eat your words. And it wasn't so much that I wanted. I wanted that. That, that I don't want to use the word vengeance, but I, I didn't want no, that. I, I didn't. I didn't want that animosity or anything like that. But at the same time, it made me just think. Well, look, one day, I'm going to do. I want to work so hard and put so much into it, so that one day there is the potential of of you go doing a, doing a 180 on on your thoughts on it. And and you know what? I never thought I'd ever see him again or anything like that. And I and I bumped into him, and it was very gratifying because it was like without him saying that, even though it was. Uh, not horrible, but it was just something that didn't need to be done. Like without him doing that and me hearing of that, I don't know if I would have worked yeah, as, weird, as, as hard as hard as, as hard as I did, or, or, or made the, the choices or the risks or things like that. You know, and I think that's really important that you do. You know, that like you said, when people come and ask you stuff, I think that having that thought process of rather than saying one day I'll do it, do it and go. This is day one. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's really important. Fair play to him though, as well for. Hundred percent, yeah, hundred you know, percent. He could have just not said anything to me, or yeah. blah, blah, but actually just bumping into him and having that conversation was actually well, really gratifying, and it was really it like calmed everything for me. That, yeah. you know, I'm still hungry, still got fire in belly, and wanting to achieve stuff and do stuff with siege. That's never going to go until I stop breathing. But like, but um, but yeah, like it was just everything I wanted from that happening happened. So, so um, we I. I don't want to keep you forever. I have got a bunch of questions. Yeah, let's do, it. let's do it. We'll, we'll do that in just a moment. Because um, what I'm going to do, just before the questions, I'm going to stop for a toilet break because I drank too much tea and water. But before I get to that, you've just said, you said this a couple of times, you're still hungry, you've still got fire, right? Yeah. We've just talked about everything Siege is currently. Mm -hmm. um, it, have you got in your mind mm -hmm. that you're happy to share, because I'm conscious <laughs> you might not be, uh, next steps for Siege and where you want to go from here? Half of it is refine the process. Like, uh, again, I said this earlier and I'm sorry to regurgitate it, but yeah, it is about every year and every time we can looking at what we do, make it as best as possible. Yeah. Um, and half of it is just do other things that, that complement the business. And what I mean by that is just, just things that like, that it would make sense for us to do. Yeah. There are some things I can't say, obviously, oh, for obvious absolutely. reasons. Yeah. Yeah. But I think things like just along the painting side of stuff, just do things which complement the painting. And I think that, that, that really make it, uh, uh, that when we do those things, it's not, oh my God, they're doing that. It's, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. And I think, I think that they're the kind of things that we are doing and that we will be doing. Um, I, I would love to drop a bit of a worm on a hook, but I can't because of various <laughs> reasons. Um, uh, but all I would say is watch your space. There's loads of awesome things that are going to be coming very soon. And, you will when you see them you'll be like oh yeah that makes sense you know? yeah and that, that's kind of like what what i've got planned so see you've got a newsletter a youtube channel an instagram page on all the socials all that kind of stuff um i will i will link them all below thank you very much i'll link everything below um follow them on everything i i mean i follow siege on instagram just so that it gives me my daily reason to throw up once i've so seen sorry. once i've seen what you put out <laughs> But um, I'll link everything behind it below anyway. If there's exciting things, I don't have a clue what's coming, but I'm excited to see what you do. 11 years and 90 staff is an incredible achievement. It's yeah. amazing. Uh, I'm going to stop for a quick bathroom break, but we're going to come right back with... Um, uh, you'll know, I don't know what I'm telling you. You won't know there's a difference. I'll edit it. So, uh, but tough. Uh, I'm going to come back. We've asked the Thanes. I've got James in. What's your questions? I, have, I haven't looked at them. I'm very, very excited. So yeah. So we're going yeah. to jump into the WhatsApp thread for guest questions, see what the Thanes have asked. I'm assuming some of them sensible, some of it stupid. Uh, we'll go through those and then that'll be us. Not another Bacon Army, please. Not another Bacon Army. <laughs> that's, that, I was literally sat here thinking, that's the title of the, of the video. Yeah, <laughs> Who Wants Bacon Space Marines is the title of the video for yeah. today. Cool. So we'll be right back. Right, I've actually, I, there was a small break because I went and got a cup of tea as well. Because I needed a cup of tea. So this is, this is a section that I wanted to try out. Um, Thane's unfiltered, essentially. I opened up a new thread in the Thane's WhatsApp uh, kind of community area that we have. So we have like multiple tiers of mm -hmm. membership. Stains are one of our highest tiers. Oh, and I'm always thinking about how do I give more back to them? Mm -hmm. So we talked about earlier the concept of a live studio audience. We're going to trial it with That'd those guys amazing. first because they're just committed people. Um, and we had them here for like the opening of the studio as well. So I opened up this thread this morning. This, I, I don't know why I didn't think of this before. This morning I was like, I, people do this via Patreon. I'm just going to open it up to the Thanes. Um, I haven't looked at the questions. I've just looked. It's about eight or nine. Okay. So it's, we're going to have a gentle start. Let's go. Right? Let's go. 
Um, but I haven't read them. I'm going to read them out. To, uh, he might turn around to you and be like, I'm not answering that. Fuck you. <laughs> I um, say, I'll, never, I'll, never be, I'll never say that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so we've got a bunch. We'll start off with Paul Gray, who says, what project has he enjoyed taking on the most from start to finish? I think this is for you personally. Me personally? Now. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's, that's going to be quite a few years ago. But I will I'll, I'll actually tell you, I did a few. Um, so just when Farsight got a new model. Recently? Uh, yeah, recently. So, um, so. Just Farsight obviously got a new a new model quite recently, but um, just literally a few, I think a month or two before that model was previewed or whatever, we had a project whereby a client, a, an old client of the business that I had painted some Farsight Enclave for many, many years ago, came back and said, look, I never actually got a Farsight model done for my army through you guys. They, they, I think they had one or I don't know what the, the circumstances were. But they came back and uh, booked in a Farsight model with us um, and had a couple of little extra things. They had like a, like they're very much into like making Tao look very samurai esque, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like they're very much that kind of way. Um, and they had like a little, uh, uh, he wanted like a, um, I can't remember the Japanese name for it, but the, the, the banner format that, um, yeah. that, that Samurai Warriors had. He wanted Farsight to have one of those. So I actually painted the Farsight and painted the banner. Um, and it was really nice to return to a previous client of the business that I had painted stuff for like literally five, six, seven, eight years oh, ago wow. and, and paint a, like a, almost like a final model for that client, for that, for that army. So that was a really, really like um, really nice project for me personally, because it meant I could just got to get back on the brushes for a client. And if you can't tell by now, I hate not having my hand on the steering wheel yeah, at all yeah. whatsoever. So, so like, so yeah, so um, it was good to do that. And it was just really nice to, to just paint something in my favourite colour for a faction that I really like, um, that uh, that that just gave me some time on the brushes that wasn't a specialist product for the a specialist project for the for the business or or just something in my normal normal painting. Do you, so, do you miss client painting? Yeah, I do. Really miss? Yeah, it? I do. One hundred percent. Yeah, I do. Uh, it feels really. That's, that's. I think for me, that's the that was the hardest thing for me to relinquish, which sounds crazy, but for me, that's probably the hardest thing that I've I've had to give up. Because okay. the problem is, is that I'll see projects that get booked in or I'll see, I'll have a meeting with a client or something and they'll tell me their idea for a project or for a character or whether it's a CS or whether it's an army or whether it's like this or whatever, you know, and I'll be like, oh my God, I want to do that. And, and, the, and, the, and, and it's always that moment of like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like, oh, I haven't got time to do it. How close then. have you been to be like, I'm, I'm going to make time. I really want to do this. So, yeah, so, so. I've had to really, really restrict myself from, from anything that's greater than a single model. And there's been the odd occasion. So there's only been in the last two, three years, there's only been two projects that I've done for clients because I've either had some past attachment to it or I've looked at the model and gone, I have to paint that model. <laughs> um, what, one's a fast site that I explained to you, which is a past client that, um, that I had done a lot of work for. Um, and the other one was we had a client book in um, a custom service uh, Azureman. Uh, and I love Phoenix Lords. Like I've really, I've always, apart from, I, I'm massive obviously into, uh, into Space Marines, into Blood Angels and stuff. But like, um, but I've always had an, like an affinity with like the, the Phoenix Lords. I, I just like them as characters. I think the, the, the models are amazing, etc. And we had a client ask us to do an Azurman, but painted in the scheme. So Forge World used to produce a statue of, of, of Azurman. It used to be like a, uh, I don't know what size up it was, but they used to, they produced like a, a statue of Azurman. And the box art for that on the Forge World website was this white armored, this white predominant armor color with like a blue trim uh, and blue accents. And the client said, I want an Azurman in this pose, running like with a sword outstretched, shooting the, the, one of his wrist weapons. But I don't want it painted in the blue azurman colour. I want it painted in the Forge World white scheme. Oh, wow. So for me, that was like, oh my god! Like, so I literally, I was like, I said, to, I said to Joe, I said, I am painting that model. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, there's not many times when I have to, when I have to like enforce a specific way I want something done. But for that. I'm painting that model, yeah. yeah. And, I'm pulling rank. Yeah, that's I'm pulling mine. rank, and I'm painting that. Yeah, and that's that. That's it. But yeah, I do that for me. I miss. I do miss, as a painter and as someone who enjoys painting, I do miss that, especially when I have the meetings with clients and they tell me their crazy ideas or yeah. these amazing ideas that, I've, that, that, that no one's thought of or that it's a colour scheme and I'm doing like this. You know, I, I, I do miss it hugely. But, amazing. But I'm not, I'm not 
I, I shouldn't be doing that, you know. So, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Nick says, what feature on a model do you dislike painting the most and why? Uh, I think cloth. Cloth is cloth is a weak point for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, so so it's something that I obviously that I've painted a lot of Space Marines, okay, over the years, a bit personal, a bit projects in the early days. Um, cloth is something that I actually really struggle with as, as, as a painter like it's something that I, I've never truly got it to a point where I'm happy with it uh, in the sense of like I look at all the other things that I like the level I can do stuff to or whatever blah blah but cloth yeah cloth for me is is thing so I, that was my, that's what my 2024 kind of like I've got to get better at it this year kind of thing like so I'm trying to paint a lot more things that have cloth on them so that I actually get get better at doing it but yeah cloth I, I hate I, I have always disliked cloth yeah. I find it. In, I genuinely find it interesting and fascinating um, that in 2024, 11 years in, 90 plus staff, <laughs> you're like, no, I need to improve still. Yeah, of course. But that's uh, painting. Yeah, of the course. The thing that I don't really do for clients anymore. So yeah, but it, it, that's a really good, a really good uh, like, a question and statement. I, I think, yeah, like I, I know kind of like where I'm at as a painter, but there are painters in the business that, like, I look like I'm finger painting with Crayola. <laughs> you know, like you know, like so, so, so there, there, are, there are painters that are, there are painters in, in Siege that are, that are way more talented than me, and like, and like, and and that they can blink and it goes poof and turns into this oh, amazing model, you know, like, uh, and, I, but that's that's also a real silver lining of what I see on a day to day basis, and I say this to all the team in the office, and when new people join us in the office as well, it's like you're going to see stuff if you if you do paint models and you're into it, you're going to see stuff, and you're going to be. You're gonna have vomitation of models every day. Like you're gonna see all this stuff that, like, literally is like, oh my god, like you know. And I think one of the things that's that's really good about that is it kind of makes you feel like you have to be at that level. Yeah. So a good example, like Re Mother Half, like when she she didn't know Warhammer, so when she met me, she was like, what the hell is Warhammer? What the hell is this? Blah blah. She'd only ever seen stuff that was in the office, or that I'd show her from work, or she'd see like stuff at home or she'd see stuff like in, in magazines at home. So her understanding of what miniatures painted to, painting, miniature painting was, was that. Yeah. So then when she attempted for a laugh one day, I was like, we were like, oh, let's just paint some models together, blah, blah, blah. Her, her bar of what needs to be done is what she sees. So immediately she started painting really neat, really sharp, really clean. And I was like, why the hell are you painting as good as that, blah, blah, blah. And it's because that's, she's been around that all the time. So in answer to that like you know it, that yes i constantly feel like i need to improve because i'm seeing this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis that is the bar yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and that's that's the reality that's incredible yeah. i i i mean i joked earlier when i said I, I have you on instagram and it makes me vomit daily but that i i, I really struggle and it's not just it's not just siege it's page but i follow the, the rich grays and oh, all those shit. kinds of david sopers all those kinds of people on instagram uh who make who do incredible things with brushes yeah yeah <clears throat> And I really struggle. I, we've had a couple of conversations about this in the past. At some point in the near future, we need to pick it up again. Because um, I start painting. I love, I love the hobby. I, I can build forever. And I have this vision always as to what I want it to look like. And I'll start painting. And it won't be that neat or tidy because I'm out of practice. And, get, and the reason why I'm out of practice is because I get to that stage and I'm like, this is shit. And it goes in the cupboard. Or it goes, Joe, rescue that. Finish it for the channel. Because I just, and I, I can't, I really, like, I find that I just don't have that patience, I think, to sit and kind of, and it might not be that it might just be that I'm approaching it wrong, perhaps. But um, I, I do think that, that, that I, it's, I'm very torn with Instagram, for example, social media in general, actually, between the it's bad for me because I see this standard that I just can't achieve and I'm a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. So the second I can't just do it, well, yeah. throw a temper, throw a temper tantrum without going away. But it's also good for me, like it can be done because yeah. that's not Photoshop. He's painted that, yeah, you yeah. know. So I, I'm, I find it's, I'm really torn between the two, whether it's positive or negative for me personally. The, the one thing I would say to you is a, is a bit of a thing with, in return to that is that like the thing with social media is that you are seeing the finished article. Yes. You're not, you haven't seen all the trials and tribulations and all the, all, the, all the experiments, things going wrong, things like that. So I get what you're saying totally because that thing about Instagram and social media is, is not just within miniature painting. No, of course. It's, it's, it's in lots of other things. Yes. But... But 
I get totally what you're saying because so, that, it, it, yeah. Social media in general is the bit that people want you to see. Yes, normally, yeah. right? Rather than than the bits they don't want you to see, yeah. the failed projects, <laughs> the bin full of models. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> there's one good one and twenty over there. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So cloth for cloth for 2024. Cloth for 2024. Yeah. I would always have assumed that for a person like yourself, it would have been something like eyeballs or something super super like tiny and detailed. Do you know? No it's, it's real strange. I have always tried to paint neat, sharp, clean, smooth because it, that constantly is making you push your, your hand and hand and muscle memory and, co and coordination and stuff with the brush. Making cloth look like it, like blending cloth the way that it, that natural light hits it and affects the shapes, the volumes, and also the material. Like for me, that's something I've always struggled with. Okay. Yeah, I I, I painted a, 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 a commissar Yarrick for one of my comp entries in the past, and like. I was happy with everything except for his his black cloth. It looked flatter than a bit of road. Like it was just it was horrendous. Like I was just like I can't I just can't render the cloth how I want it to. And that's the thing I got feedback on it was like it's neat, it's sharp, it's clean, it's like it's good, but the cloth is so, boring as anything. At the very very latest, we'll get you back at the end of the year. Like how did your cloth go? I, if I don't nail cloth this year, I'm going to give up miniature painting. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why exclusive. That's why. That's why. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Adrian. He says, what should be the steps to take to improve as a painter? And also, when should you stop with a model? As we all know, perfect is a death and finish. No, I said that earlier. You there did, you yeah, yeah. Good question, actually. Adrian. Things to, like, there's, there's, two, there's two parts of that. Yeah, so steps to take to steps, improve as a painter. Steps to take. Paint stuff that you don't, that you never painted before. Paint with colours that you don't normally use. Okay. And just get in the habit of understanding uh, what you're using your time for. So, like, is this thing that I'm doing for my army? If it is, Focus on that. That's your comfort zone. Your comfort zone as a painter is your enemy. I always say this. I say this on classes. I say this when I do one-on-one -on -one tuition. I, I say this all the time. The complacency, and I'll, like me as an example, painting Blood Angels or painting Red is my comfort zone. I love it. Eat, sleep, breathe, dream about it, etc. blah, blah. Outside of that is where I will learn and get better or try something or do something new because it's, it's out and you, your comfort zone of what you paint within your army, your faction or, or whatever, or even color that you always paint stuff. Like when you make a decision on painting a new project or painting a new, new miniature or whatever, oh, I'll paint it purple because I, I love purple, you know. It's at that point when you, when you go, actually, do you know what? Today I'm going to paint dark green or I'm going to paint orange because I don't really paint that very often. I'm yeah. going to combine that with a miniature that I would never normally paint. So I always paint armored space marines. I'm going to paint... I'm going to paint, today I'm going to paint an orange squig. Yep. Yeah, okay. So it's fleshy. It's and... fleshy, it's totally different. The moment you do that and you do that flip, what it does for you is it makes you start actually concentrating on trying to achieve the same sort of quality or standard that what you would do within your comfort zone. Okay. And the moment you do that, you'll start learning those other, those other things, those colours, those, those shapes, those, that, that miniature, you'll start doing that. I, I love 40K, all right? Okay, the models are amazing. I love 40K. Age of Sigma models are amazing as well, and I argue that Age of Sigma models, in my opinion, they're the, just the, the the things that are involved with them. They're probably more aesthetically attractive models as a painter for me because they're totally different from yep. what I'm not used to. So if you do paint a lot of 40k, buy an Age of Sigma character from a faction that has details that are totally different from what you would paint in 40k, and try and paint it with lots of colours and things that you don't normally do, and use it as a total experimentational piece while still trying to paint it to the same quality or better than what you would normally do. If you do that you will honestly learn loads, progress more, and also have a much better understanding of those different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think a lot of people, like we, so we said earlier, right, failure is your best teacher normally. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people, I, I often find, I think with miniatures in general, people are really frightened of failure with miniatures because they're fucking expensive. Yeah. And even to the, get to the point, normally to get to the point where you're going to paint it, you've put time and effort in to clean up mold lines, stick it all together, you know, get it all ready to, to go. Uh, there's plenty of good strippers out there, and you can always, if you if you paint similar, you can always just spray over it again. Yeah. yeah. But I kind of get why people are afraid to fail with a miniature. Look, it's not life or death. Like worst case, you can strip the model again. You know, um, uh, as I said, like I think if you if you think work and paint outside of what you're used to, you, you'll just you'll learn so much more. Yeah. Um, you know, I said I, I, going back to what you said before, like, I I I steered away from models with cloth because I was I, I was you know, a bit what scared really of, of, of doing it, being honest. Um, and I think that's something you just need to just tackle that mm -hmm. thing. Because at the end of the day, if it's rubbish, you just strip it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And so the second part was, uh, when, when do you know when to stop? That's a bit of a that's open, a really open, hard open ended thing because like you can always tweak, 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 tweak. But the thing is, is like the time you're investing, what, I, I would step back and go, right, well, I've painted it to where I'm really happy with it. 
However, there's this little thing niggling me or there's, this, there's these lots of little things niggling me. Do you invest that time that you're, gonna, that you're never going to get back, continue to do that, or are you going to go, I'll just start something new? I think the thing is, uh, not to be too critical, Adrian, the other problem is I think it depends on what you're painting for. So knowing Adrian, he's probably painting it for an army for a tabletop mm -hmm. because I think that that line is very different depending on whether you're painting for yourself, you're painting for competition, you're painting for an army. Mm -hmm. Like that, that massively varies when to stop because I think yeah. competition, I know people that are literally up the night before still making, are people at Warhammer Fest, James, uh, in hotel rooms. I'm not the best person to talk about this because <laughs> I was up at 5 a.m. painting in my hotel room. Exactly. Like, re got me up, re went, you've got to paint, get up. <laughs> So, so I'm not the best person to be uh, to be going. Oh yeah, you should definitely be done before before yeah. the competition because I was painting at five a.m. before Warhammer Fest on one day. Yeah. Um, but you're quite right. Like that. Yeah, it was, it was a bad day. Um, I think I think it's really hard to answer that question when to stop. Um, in general, actually, for anything, you know, because you, he's one hundred percent right. We've said this already on the on the show. Like fit, like perfect is the enemy of finished always. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think. Is, that's a tough one. And, th and this is before we overlay the fact that this is essentially art. Yes. You're looking at it as, the, as a person creating it going, I'm happy with it. Somebody else might look at it and go, I would have done that purple rather than green. Yeah, because art's incredibly subjective. Exactly. You know, and and, and that, that's just something to bear in mind. But I would, yeah, yeah I'd say get to a point where you can step away from it and go, I am actually really happy with it. There might be a couple of things on it that I want, that I'm, I want to tweak or that I'm not too happy on that. But... Do I invest time that I'm not going to get back on that, or do I just go right next one, start learning on that? I um, kind of, I kind of try and apply um, what I call the Instagram rule. Like, would I post this on social media? Because if the answer is yes, and I've posted stuff on social media that doesn't come anywhere near a rich grey, of course it won't. But I'm happy with it, and so I'm happy enough to show it off. Yep. So I'm, that's I'm, I'm good. That's done because I'm happy enough to show it off. So I, I feel like that's a good place to stop. Uh, cool. Anyway, thank you, Adrian. James, he's got two as well. Uh, what has been the most challenging, stroke, difficult project you've ever had? That is a very good one. Um, do you know what? Sometimes it's it's the projects that you think are going to be easy that that tends not to be, in the sense of you get a very linear kind of like I want this, 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 yeah. and when you start formulating it and start putting it on the model or you start the process of doing it, like you could have a custom scheme whereby the person is adamant they want these two colours on the miniature or something like that, and it's it's when you're creating it that it becomes really tough to. It, there's different ways to use color, like to use color to draw attention, use color to insinuate mood, use color to insinuate different things on the model, um, like lighting effects, for example, or like an ambience of the environment that that person's within or whatever. So it, it's, it's the difficulty of, of a really hard project is sometimes when you do get a bit of a linear spec and it's like, it needs to be this, when it's a custom one, because you need to somehow work out the best way to use those colors while still retaining the, the model being what it is. A really good example of it is uh, one of the, Amy, one of the team members, recently painted an avatar of Kane. Now, that was for an uh, Eldar Latok army. So, avatar of Kane, he's a giant, fiery man. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, we know what an avatar is. If you, paint it in the stand, if you paint it in standard colors, if you look at a lot of avatars of Kane that are painted, they, they typically tend to be orange, obviously, for, for, for the the magma flesh or whatever blah blah and then what will happen is that you'll have a subtlety of like a green loincloth or a, for the old tan or you'll have a red thing for this uh craft world or whatever but our, our the client on that one wanted an avatar of cane that was a latok themed but the, the gave us complete free, free creativity on painting it in the latok scheme so it's like how do we apply yellow blue onto the avatar and still make him look like he's on fire. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Because um, he's got literal flames on him. Because he's got it? literal flames on him. So, so again, like I had a bit of a, a team meeting with Amy and we, Amy had some really good ideas. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's great. Let's do that, 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 that. And I said, well, why don't we just do this or maybe do it? So we had a really good team meeting and came up with a way of transferring all the Alatoc colors and scheme onto the avatar of Kane while still trying to retain the fact that it's a giant fiery <laughs> god of death, you know. Um, and and, and she'd she done a babe roof and, and smashed it out of the park. Like, you really, really, really done well, like with like putting the, all the flames were blue, like had really nice start, different tones, like Alatoc blue to, uh, colors on there. Loincloth done in a specific color. That you know, the head was was yellow, the yellow part of the Alatoc scheme. The head crest was all dark black, just to contrast it and make the face light up really massively. So it was a really good use of color in keeping with the Alatoc scheme, while still trying to retain the the the, the it's an avatar of Kane. Yeah. He's on fire, you know. So it's so pretty difficult. 
on the whole. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's an example of what I mean. It's, it's like a very linear kind of project. I want a late avatar. Cool, okay. Um, how are we going to do that? You know, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's kind of an example. You get a lot of them or? What, late talk avatars? Yeah. That's no, the first one. <laughs> so like, no, like just no. really like really difficult linear, no budge, this is exactly how it, do you, do you get a lot of that or? Um, I think it is, we, we ha look, you have all manner of clients. You have clients that are very artistically uh, understanding. They know color theory. They know this. They know they want this specific paint, this specific color, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, it's like, I really want uh, Imperial Fists. I want um, them to be this company and they need to have this, 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 this. And, and they don't have any, uh, they don't maybe don't have the understanding of paint or the understanding of color and stuff like that. But they though, I really definitely, definitely want green lenses on the, on the, on the helmets, you know, for the, for the Marines. Okay, cool. Okay, great. I might suggest blue because of primary triadic color scheme. So, you know, it might, blue might be better. Um, but no, I definitely want green. Okay, cool. That's fine. And, and the, you have conversations like that, you know, and, it, and it's that, that, that's where it becomes a little bit more difficult. It's, it, you have to understand, even though we are, as painters, we have the experience that we do or that we have certain biases to colors or processes or techniques or things like that. Ultimately, it's the client that's the most important thing. Absolutely. And, and, and like, if they want green lenses, that's fine. You know, there's nothing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. It goes back to that thing we're saying about art, for example. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it is perfectly fine, and we're, we're more than happy to do that. But that's the, they're examples of, of difficulty. Okay. The second part was, what's the most requested model that CJ's had to paint? Do you have this? It, it, it swings day in, day out, uh, based on various factors. It could be, it could be. The latest army that's in meta. It could be uh, Warcom putting out a brand new miniature that's not released yet, and everyone asks for it. It could be um, it could be someone goes on a, on a on a on a channel and they play this army list, and it's not meta, but the army list does really well on that video. And then people are like, I want that army list, and I want those models painted exactly. Like. It, it honestly changes. The one thing I can say to you that is consistent is probably Tiberus the Red Wake. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so the you know that character we have. I think that is the most, we've done the most unique versions of Tiberus the Red Wake. Uh, uh, that's that we've done at least five or six in different poses so that everyone's individual for each client. But, you know, it, that, that character has been one of the most requested characters I think we've ever done. That's interesting. Yeah, he's an amazing character. Savage, yeah, of course. Savage as anything, but like... I didn't it, expect yeah, him but, to be like the high... Yeah. I, like, I literally would have been like Avatar or... Like, a, like something like... Ty you know. Tiberus is, is, is Tiberus Red Wake, definitely. Because like, it's such a unique crazy crazy savage character like and i think it's got an amazing backstory to him um yeah like he, he's a very very popular character again like tower very popular um marines are always going to be popular yeah. um you know um, but, but yeah. how many lions did you have to do quite a few <laughs> quite a few yeah. when he's packing 20 attacks it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. uh cool okay so thank you so much james legend dags <sighs> this is where the uncut thing is interesting he, he basically says uh which sexual favours would you accept for material discount? Uh, and does anyone close to you need a kidney? I don't need any organs, thankfully. Uh, if <laughs> At you the do, moment. If you do, put it in the comments. Um, uh, the other question, uh, I would say that uh, I don't accept anything like that. Um, uh, I'd have to run it by Ree and she'd probably say no. So, oh, okay. So. Might give her a night off. <laughs> uh, I don't know. No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Degs. Anyway, beautiful questions. Jill, uh, technical paints, for example, Blood for the Blood God, Streak and Grime, etc. Yeah. Which one do you keep a sash off and which one would you avoid like the plague? So what's your best favourite technical paint like that and which is the one that you you hate? Uh, if you have a hate. I don't have a hate. I, I, it's really, I always, it always makes me like, not laugh, but it always makes me think uh, that thought process when it comes to paint. Um, Love, blood for the blood god, definitely. Like if you click world eaters or if you if you want to put loads of loads of blood, blood on models, blood for the blood god is probably, in my opinion, the one of the best best paints for doing it's it. It's really good. Yeah, it is very very good. Like I don't think there there are lots of paints out there that are very similar, but I think it is probably the best blood. And effect. a simple application can look incredible as well. Yeah, definitely. Like I th and also let, for me personally, less is more when you use it. I think sometimes I think it, it, you can yeah. you can pour a pot on a model quite easily and and it. It's too much. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. Uh, as for hate, it's not so much. I, any all paints are tools in a toolbox. Like you know, the, uh, coverage things like that. Like um, you can have a really good, really good green that you like the color of, but it covers really badly. You know, it doesn't mean it's a bad paint. It just means it's not good for blocking in green. You know, you, you could do it as a glaze or do it as a, a filter layer or something like that. Whatever. But um, I think out of all the paints, probably just through lack of use and thing that I just for not using it, um, and I've got it, is the verdigris. I, I just don't use it. I use okay. I use a lot of blues and green paints 
to, to like turquoise paint. It's nylac oxide, is that the one? Yeah, nylac oxide. I've got it. It's not a bad, like if you want verdigris, you can just use it, you know, it's like, but I, I don't tend to use it. I, yeah. I just make verdigris out of a couple of colors and use and paint it on. Um, yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't say I hate it. I just, I just don't use it. Yeah, I've okay. got it and don't use it. Interesting. Okay. Um, and she then says, as amateur painters, we look to you and others in the professional hobby for inspiration and advice. Who do you look up to? Uh, uh, you got three hours. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I have. Yeah, you haven't. <laughs> but you've mentioned him a few times at Rich Gray. I know Rich personally, and uh, you know, and he, he's a, uh, like that. What he can do with paint, he bends paint like a, a wizard bends magic. You know, like it's just. Rich comes to mind because I met him at Golden Demon once. I was there with a guy called Martin Waller, who's an incredible painter. Himself, Another amazing anyway. painter. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I was I was chatting to Rich, who's a lovely guy. Um, and so I started following. I didn't know who he was before. If I'm honest with you, before the Golden Demon, and, and Martin introduced me. So I started following him on Instagram, and the reason why he always comes to mind is he, I don't know if you've seen it, but he painted Mortarian's wings and he painted human eyeballs yeah, onto them. Yeah. And I, I always say to people, go find that part because it's unreal what he yeah, did. It, it's when amazing. you realize that's a completely hand painted it's eye. It's incredible. Like he is a, an absolute, you know, I look at the Dante that he's bringing, that he's doing, and I'm like, I wonder if I could potentially ask him to sell my soul for that model. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Sexual favors of the kidney. That, that, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Rich Gray, definitely. Uh, Rodrigo Accor, probably one of my favorite okay. painters. Um, he's probably one of my favorite painters. He's a really, really super talented painter. Um, and, and look, I, I wouldn't be sitting here and paint the way that I do it, and if, if I didn't look up to the heavy metal team, like genuinely. Yeah, like, as a kid, um, White Dwarf, all the codexes, uh, you know, that, that was my childhood. You know, Box Arts was my childhood. Mike McVeigh, you know, like they just... For me, that they are, they kind of instilled in me. I, I hadn't really painted any other models apart from airfix kits and tanks and things like that when I was a kid. So like, so like sci-fi models. The first, my first touch of sci-fi models was was Warhammer. And like, you know, seeing seeing all the heavy metal paint jobs is is kind of like what what steered me in what I hoped. About. And now my painting is nowhere near the refinement or level of heavy metal. But like, but like I I I, I look I look up to them. They, they yeah. like for, I think. For, most people's first foray into seeing anything painted, they've probably seen heavy metal first. Yeah. Because it's in a codex or it's on a box art, yeah. you know, or even, you know, some of the website images, if that's in modern day, you go to the website, you see the image is painted by heavy metal, mm -hmm. ultimately, because they want to showcase it at its best way. I, I one, of my, one of the people I follow the most um, is, is Daz Latham. You know, he's a big Eldar person as well. I'm a big Eldar person. Some of his stuff that he's done is, and obviously he was heavy metal and he's yeah. part of the design team now insane what yeah. he does so absolutely yeah, it's interesting I, but I think a lot of people can go to Rich and Dave Saper they can go to Angel Guerrero's and they forget that Heavy Metal was probably their first really like proper experience of fully painted high high quality miniatures I, I, I agree totally and I, I think one thing to say like you mentioned Daz I mean Daz is a phenomenal painter and I, I, I remember looking at his, the Heavy Metal Masterclass book one of my favourite books ever produced like his Sanguinor non metallic Metal uh, which was in White Dwarf but they pulled them all together into that one book like that for me is an article and him painting that. That is one of my uh, one of my favourite heavy metal paint jobs, as well as the non-metallic metal Tyco um, that Tom from the heavy metal team painted, I believe. Yeah. Um, I, painting heavy metal style, whether you like it or not, the core competencies of it, the level of refinement, the level of precision and accuracy and smoothness that it takes to paint do a paint job in that style, you cannot. You cannot look at that and not appreciate the yeah. skill and time and effort and that and quality of that paint job. Whether you prefer a more artistic sort of Spanish style with more brush strokes that are visible, or you know more more sort of artistic creative style of painting or whatever in that way, there is something about painting neat, sharp, smooth, clean, refined that takes a certain level of skill that you have to be able to execute. Yeah, and you just can't. It's a it's a factual thing that you just can't take away from you yeah. know. And I and I love. All of the heavy metal stuff, like all the heavy metal team, they're, they're, they're phenomenal in what they do. Um, painting models for box art to sell a model, which is, and, and in a very sharp, clean, super precise way. Yeah, this is arguably the most important part of the marketing. Because mm -hmm. if the model looks crap on the box. <laughs> yeah. Um, Chris asks the ever mature question, kind of reference color theory, I guess. Why is the sky blue? You know what? I actually don't know that answer, which, I which, which for me, it, I, I'm going to, literally, as soon as we get off this, I'm going to Google it because I don't know and that frustrates isn't me. Isn't the sky not blue? It's just a reflection, atmospheric reflection of the ocean. I'm going to say yes. I don't know. I, I will, I'm going to, I'm going to fact check that myself because I need yeah. to, I need to 
get don't, rid of my, uh, my don't, ignorance. Don't trust James with colours. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know colour three, but not the why the sky's blue. So. <laughs> We've got one final one. Uh, the fates have been quite kind. I was expecting more lunacy questions, actually. They've been quite kind. They've been sensible. Well done, Thanes. I'm impressed. Uh, when, so Sean says, when you are significantly modifying a model for commission with things like green stuff, where do you start? Do you plan things out in detail or do you throw it on and see what happens? I wish it was turn it on and see what happens. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think for most, to be honest with you, I think for most people, if they thought I'm going to make a fur pelt, they'd probably start putting green stuff on and trying to sculpt fur into it. Like, yeah. And they just go for it and see what happens. And oh, there we go, it's done. Do you know one of the, uh, we, we had a sculpting class at, at Bad Moon this weekend and it is really interesting because I, I was talking to, a, I mean, Ben who taught it and, and I, was, I was there just to assist and just to do it. Obviously just, I'm, I'm, sculpting for me is something that I'm very keen on and very interested in getting better at. But like, um, sculpting is, I've been painting for a lot of years. I tried to sculpt in the last couple of years. I've tried to start sculpting and doing some bits of sculpting. And I can honestly say to you that it is probably one of the hardest things I've ever attempted to do, purely because of the working time and the material. Um, but I experienced it this weekend. Like we, we, we basically, for the first, for our, for our sort of like sculpting class, we teach basically bones, flames, and skulls, shapes and things that really since a child, like you know kind of what they are, if that makes sense. Yes. Very, very referenceable. Very referenceable, yeah, and very fitting for forty k, especially skulls. Um, but like the 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 thing that I would the thing that I would say is that when you if you say to somebody draw a skull or draw draw a shape, they'll be able to draw it like that because it's repetition of knowing that shape over many years. It makes it instantly uh, easy to do that. Yeah. The moment you try and physically create it out of material, everything goes out the window. Yeah. Like it, it's 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 really it's interesting how the physical creation of it rather than just drawing it that but that difference in execution it results in a complete difference in sort of approach to doing it and the thought process that's behind it um in answer to your question uh, just in a crazy off tangent as i went on but like the the really the most important thing is like looking at what the end result is going to be choosing the best options to get as close as that with kit to start off with as in is the like, 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 for example, Gabriel Seth, like he said, if we want a model that the host model or the dolly model that we're, we're doing a lot of sculpting work on to be in a, in a pose that we can either cut up and make it more in line with what the client wants or the vision of what we want for the model. And also works, has all the surface area and details and space so that we can anatomically make it look right and also keep it in line with what the narrative is of that model, if that makes sense. There are certain things that you just need to sometimes just try. So we, where he said about just slapping it on, et cetera. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't so much as say we're going to throw green stuff at a model and hope for the hope and hope it works. I, I would say there is a lot of calculated decision making behind it, but ultimately one of the most important things is getting the shapes correct. And that's like lies back to the thing I was saying, like getting the shapes correct of the things we're putting on the model has to be the first fundamental thing. If you're creating a fur pelt, you need to make sure that it falls in a way like for example, perfect example here on the chair, it falls in a way that looks natural, that looks like it's draped over it, if that makes sense. If yeah. you put a big blob on here <laughs> and then go <laughs> like that, it's, it, it needs to fit the model correctly and yeah. look, look realistic. Um, a really good thing to do is to just, just practice, with, just practice with, um, with some green stuff on maybe like a bit of plastic card and that, that will help you to just want to work on stuff and get used to shapes and things like that. Um, Sculpting is hard, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't sculpt, but one of the things that I am often quite um, complimentary of for GW and themselves, we, we, we talked about painting a lot, right? You talk about natural light and where the light hits and highlighting in the right places. One of the things GW does really well with their models in general is the natural flow of the model. Mm -hmm. uh, they often have, sometimes not so, but more often than not, a very a lovely flow. That would be, I think, the thing for me that I would, so I would struggle with detail sculpting anyway. But I think I would really struggle with, I've made this beautiful, perfectly shaped cloak and I'm going to put it on him and it doesn't make any sense now because it's just kind of flat. On it. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that's where I'd really struggle with it. Like, I find cloaks, like, you have to sculpt it onto the model and then use the natural movement and also shapes that are underneath that cloak to kind of insinuate the flow of it. Otherwise, yeah. it looks like you just put a tablecloth over someone that's, that's been, you know, you, you, you know, in winter when you see stuff on the, on the, on the, on the clothesline, it's frozen in the yeah. cloak. Like, yeah, like, I used to wear my, that. My daddy's put it on me. My models, my models. When I first tried doing cakes, my models, my models looked like they had like a frozen sheet attached to the back of them. You know, like so, so, so. Yeah. But, oh my uh, god. Yeah. That yeah. reminds me of my childhood. Dad, where's my school jumper? It's on the washing line. Oh, good. <laughs> it's walking to school like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, I, I, it's really the other. I, I had this theory once where. 
uh, and I have I don't have any real experience in this, but I had this theory once where if I make a cloak like an actual garment, then I can fold it and shape it onto the. But the problem I always found was, uh, and it might have been the specific brand of it was literally GW's green stuff. The 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 time you have to actually work with that product is not as big as I thought it would be. No, no. It dries and starts to starts to, starts to not do what you want it to do. In my experience, at least, very very quickly. You you got like. When you first mix it, you've got probably a, a beginning working time of about 20 minutes and then it will start to cure a bit. So you've got another, uh, it becomes a bit more, a bit less pliable for another sort of 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. And then really in the latter half of the hour, that since it's on the model, it becomes a bit more fixed in place. So it's stress me, yeah, I can't do it. Yeah, but the, the thing is you can do loads of things to improve the working time, put more yellow in than blue and that kind of stuff because the yellow is a softener. Yeah. So like there, there's things you can do to kind of like counteract that. I, but I have every desire um, in the future, however long it might be, to improve my painting, I have absolutely no desire to try and do sculpting. I think that's where I would, it would, I would, <laughs> I'd be off the edge. Then that'd be me. Yeah. I couldn't do it. It, it, it. You're more than capable. It just, it just <laughs> takes, just takes practice and repetition. Um, but yeah, like uh, you know, if you're, if you're keen for get improving your painting this year, I'll gladly do some stuff with you. Definitely. Yeah. I know we spoke about it, but yeah, definitely. Keen it's, to yeah, I, I need to carve out the time because it's, it is something when, I, when it's going. Well, I've painted some stuff in the past. Well, I've been very proud of it, and I've really enjoyed the process. Good. It's one of those things that I need to sit down. I, I find it, here's an interesting question. So we've done the Thane stuff right now, but I find painting to this day still, when going well at least, quite cathartic, quite relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, do you still get that same experience from painting yourself? Mm -hmm. Or are you kind of like, over it, it's, yeah, it's just it, a daily thing I do now? No, well, do you know what? I, I, I probably paint the least now than I, uh, well, this year I've really, really, curbed that i've gone right i need to paint more that's one thing that i've definitely like 23 and during pandemic being frank because it was absolute insanity um like uh i i probably paint 23 i painted the least ever that i've ever painted and i was okay. and i hated it oh really I hated it because i was like i've got a business that's painting miniatures for people and all that painting i'm doing a thing that i've loved since i was a kid yeah but i've done it the least amount ever yeah, this yeah. year and, and for me, I, I really reached a point uh, sort of like Christmas time where I was just like, I really just need to just make sure I get time to paint for myself, whether it's... Whether so, you, doing... so you still find it that relaxing? So I'll t I'm doing a Mordian Iron Guard army. I see. Okay? Um, because like Mordians for me, my first... I've got a full Catastrophe army, but I've got a, my, my Mordians are like... The, I painted... My second model I ever painted was a Mordian Iron Guard uh, sergeant. Um, and, um, and I thought, right, I'm going to do the army that I wish I'd done when I was a kid, but I wasn't good enough to do it, and I'm gonna do it justice. And that's, that's and I love old metal models. I'm, I'm massively into old stuff. So um, I bought the crappiest Lehman Russ I could find on eBay, okay? Because I'm into tanks and I'm into, I love seeing something that's haggard go to being like really, yeah, yeah. really nice. I, I literally, not even painting, I found it super cathartic taking this Lehman Russ that was in an atrocious state, taking all the tracks off that weren't put on properly, take, ripping the sides off, re-running re, re re wheeling it, re-tracking it, with mini putt, filling all the gaps where it's been put together badly. Like, oh, I, I found it so cathartic just getting this thing that was like sitting there going, please help me. Like, you know, <laughs> like, um, and, 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 and like just bringing it to a point whereby I can then paint it for my army as well, like, and, I've, and then I haven't even started painting that yet. But the process of repairing it and fixing it and doing and bringing it to a state, bringing it to a condition where it's good for painting, you know, for me, like that's been super cathartic for me. Yeah, like, yeah. It's been a really. I see those eBay rescue things all the time, and I'm like, that's a that's a great like thing, like getting this thing that's like pre loved and then just repairing it, or whatever. Like, and then for me, that's just been really really cathartic. Um, but yeah, I, I I do do want to spend more time painting. I miss okay. I miss painting. You know, so I've set myself some goals this year. Like I'm entering a few competitions, um, you know, and uh, and 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 yeah, I've got some goals. I, I want to get an Morning Army painted. And stuff. I've always I've always wanted to enter a competition. My painting at the moment is nowhere near the level required. You say that, but but, but it, the moment you say I'm going to enter a competition, your mindset's going to be I need to paint the best yeah. I can. So you ultimately produce something that's going to be way better than potentially than what you painted before. I think I, I think I want I want like maybe six months of doing some painting and getting back into kind of the whole the whole world of painting. Um, and then maybe I'll like I'll look at one in the future. But you should. We'll you see. Should, definitely. Maybe. I always say it, and then I always just check it out because the other the other problem I have, right? One of the reasons why I'm such a perfectionist, uh, and this is a huge character flaw, is that I hate failure. I can't stand failure. Mm -hmm. I, it's, I'm terrified of it. I didn't do. I did my motorbike license the year before last, and I didn't do it for five to six years minimum, probably even longer, 
because I was very concerned about failing the test. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Loads of people fail the test. Yeah. And this time, when I actually, I actually got to point, COVID was part of the reason why I was like, no bollocks. I'm not gonna be on my deathbed and be like, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. So I went and did my, I went and did my motorcycle license. I did my first test, failed it, and my missus went, cool, look another one. Yeah. So that's it. And I, but I still to this day have such a phobia of failure that I, I get so like. I don't want to be that one person that goes to Golden Demon when everyone's posting their finalist pins and I don't have one. <laughs> like, I get that, yeah. No, I get that. I, 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 I totally understand that. Like, I'm very much very the same. I hate, hate not being able to do something. I hate not understanding how something's done because like, when you asked me about the sky being blue, I was like, oh, how do I not know the answer to that? Like, <laughs> you know, well, I don't like, really I, know. I, I, it just, you know, like, it, but, and that, but that, 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 that sort of like thought process I guarantee you, the moment I'm, we're off this, I'm like, I'm going on my phone. Yeah. Why is the sky, is blue? The sky blue? Yeah, because, because the thing is, is like, yeah, I think that mindset is really important when it comes to it. Like, and and if you've actually got a perfectionist mindset, and if you want to do, like, make things the best you can, that's the I find that the best mindset to have when it to, to apply to painting. Because if you're thinking to yourself, "I've got to do the best I can," the work you produce will be the best that you can. Because you're you're a lot of people don't. I'm not trying to turn into some kind of like mindset guru for painting or whatever. But what I would say is that like actually sitting there and thinking to yourself, "I need to be the best I can at this," and this needs to be the best thing I've painted. If you think that, you will actually paint 10 times better than you normally do because you're thinking uh, about the process yeah. of doing it and thinking about choices that you make and things like that. Um, but yeah, uh, you should definitely. I'll challenge you to enter something. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, on that note, we're going we're gonna to go because otherwise I'm going to dig myself many holes here. <laughs> Look, honestly, I mean, I wanted you to come on as the first guest anyway. Um, thank I you remember... very much for having me. I, I, it's super humbling and I, I thank you very much for having me here. You've been amazing. I remember the f like James was one of the people I spoke to before I actually went full time. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, we were in Factorum at that same time we, we filmed that podcast and I was terrified. And yep. you had some lovely words, some really kind words, really supportive. Uh, Siege obviously has become a channel sponsor. So it was important to me to get you in here and, and be one of the first guests. You've been amazing. It's been a great, I mean, I could probably chat to you for another two, three hours. I, I'm, I'm known for talking quite a bit. So, <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 will, I will pause now. But yeah, like, thank you for those kind words. That's very, very yeah, nice you're, of you. Yeah, it's amazing. You've, you've, you've done like phenomenal. So, well, you know, so, yeah. fingers crossed, you know, I, I'm, I would love for us to continue working together, Definitely. Siege in the channel yeah. as well anyway, um, because I, I, I love what you guys are doing. I love the armies we've got already, you know. Um, so fingers crossed for the future, right? Yeah, but I, I obviously, um, I want to speak on behalf of the whole of the team to say thank you for what you've done for us so far, but we wish Siege all the best going forward. Thank I'd you. love to have you on again in the future. Definitely, yeah. Uh, we've talked already today about getting him on for a game in the future as well. 100%. So hopefully you guys will see some more of James. Uh, I, like I said earlier, I will link everything below. I'll link the YouTube channel, I'll link the website, I'll link uh, the Patreon page, all that kind of stuff. Thank uh, you and then much. using those, you'll be able to find everything else. You'll be able to find the podcast. Is the podcast on your standard YouTube it's channel? It's on our standard YouTube channel, yes. We just, yeah. we literally put them out. Yeah, they, they come out every Thursday. Um, we just put them out every Thursday. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, check that out. It gives you something else to listen to. They're also on all the pl the podcast applications as well, like Spotify and stuff, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. I thought so. Yep. Um, obviously, so, see, you're always linked below every single video. If you check out that link, it's in the video description below. You can put in a request to get a quote from them. It's no obligation. You can just tell them what you're after, what you want, and they'll, and they'll get back to you pretty quickly. Uh, there is a little drop-down menu where you can tell them where you came from. Do it. Make us look important. Make sure make sure you put Liam's name in there. Yeah, it is there, so you can select yeah. it. So please do. Um, but but go for a quote. There, we say this every... We Forgive us. We say this every stream, right? We say this every stream. You're going to hate it. They're one of the most expensive, but there is a reason, and that's because, in, as far as I'm concerned, at least, for what my, wor my word is worth, they're the best out there. Um, I've had painting jobs from multiple other studios. I've seen painting jobs from multiple other studios, and they all do great work, genuinely great work. Siege for me has been the best we've ever had. That, that, so, I, I, I thank you very much for saying that. I, I look, I, I've never, and just to marry on to that, it isn't a scary thing. The thing you said, I've never ever said that we are cheap. I've never said that. <laughs> okay, um, and the reason for that is because the time and effort and skill that go into the projects, and and also the duty of care that we have for for our clients and what they're trying to create. Um, there's that triangle thing of speed, cost, and whatever the other thing yeah. is. I always forget that. But but yeah, we we. We just want to do a good job and, and be paid correctly for it, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I, we, we have this ethos on the channel in general. I would never promote something I don't believe in. Thank you. Um, I would perhaps advertise something if I was paid to advertise it, but it'd be very, very clear as a paid ad. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I don't promote anything that I don't believe in. And the reason why we promote Siege, the reason why we promote Element, is because we believe in those businesses. Mm -hmm. So, like, your support's been incredible. We love you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I hope you guys have enjoyed the show. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the show. I, like, I would love to get more people involved in this more often. I do need that list of people that you want to come on because you probably will have a bunch of people that will be like, never thought of him. Let's get him on the show. 
Uh, big shout out to James and Siege for one, working with us, two, coming all the way down here for this podcast. You're amazing. Uh, I will be, I don't know if I'm going to get this up in time. I should get this up in time, but I'm going and doing the reverse journey soon. I'm going to go uh, and be on paint perspective. So at the very, very least, check out the Siege channel and hit that subscribe button. Um, and then you'll see me on their show in a number of weeks' time. Can't wait. It's going to be great. It's going to be fun. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking forward to good. it. Uh, you guys have been incredible. If, Like I said, if you have seen this on release day, thank you so much for being a channel member. You guys are extreme. Uh, I don't understand often why you pay for us, but you do. You're amazing. And thank you to the Thanes for all your questions. You people are beautiful. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you in the next one. See you. Bye.